welcome. We're live. It is a new Awkward Sibling Hour episode. I'm um, so glad you're here because I am honestly not expecting anybody because we are talking about budgeting. Now, I don't really get what all the fuss is about budgeting, and that is because probably that my mother explained budgeting to me when I was six and then put me in charge of our family budget because, yes, a neurodivergent six-year-old who is also illiterate is fully capable of balancing a check register. But this is the Jewish tradition. It is the Jewish tradition. Um, we were just talking about Kabbalah, and this is actually part of Jewish women's magic. But anyway... Um, Nevertheless, to me, budgeting is pretty straightforward when you're setting up a budget versus following a budget. Again, it's a living document. You, It's like dancing. You're mm -hmm. improving, but, you know, you have your goal in mind of what you want to get to and approximately how you think you'll get there. Uh, how many steps it'll take and maybe you've got a little time and maybe a little spending money for a couple flourishes couple little twirls, um, maybe one or two statement moves, but nevertheless, you'll still finish the song, right? That to me, that's what budgeting is a lot like. It's a dance. But Tom still feels like he has more that he wishes his younger self understood about budgeting. So we're going to delve into that. And to help me, of course, there is Tom because this was his pitch. And there is the wonderful, the admittable Charlie and their very own personal chaos demon maybe floating by once in a while. So, Oh, yeah. Chaos demons in the background playing video games. Oh, yeah. I'm sure chaos demon has opinions as well because none of us have gotten to our current ages without having had a bunch of adventures budgeting, both good and not so great adventures. And Charlie, I think like one of the things you said yesterday about being able to budget and, you know, keep you and Chaos Demon afloat with next to zero dollars. And I mean, genuinely next to zero. Oh, yeah, it was. Because we, Tom and I have been there, too, where we literally were making total combined $25 a week for months and it is not easy to survive on that, it, especially in the 21st century. And a bunch of people probably think we're lying, and we are not. But it was real dicey, and honestly, our health didn't do great during that because oh, we no, didn't did not. Able to consume no. adequate amount of protein and fruits and vegetables. Literally, I was scraping our pennies to buy potting soil and seeds. Because, and when I was growing uh, plants, I was growing vegetables out of any piece of earth or bucket I could find. And <laughs> that's what also helped a lot. But nevertheless, take it away, Tom. Where do you want to go? Um, so to me, the, the secrets to budgeting is actually similar to the secrets of <clears throat> dating, which is you're going to, you really have to go in just planning to be curious about how frogs taste because you're going to be kissing so many frogs before you find somebody worth actually going on a date. Oh, you're so not wrong. And budgets are the same of there is no initial perfect budget. No. Mm -hmm. There's no correct way to budget your specific life on a given day that you're going to know ahead of time without a lot of practice mm -hmm. because we're all a bit different and our lives are a bit different. And so it's that it's another thing that you need to go into to play with, not to solve perfectly. And I know growing up, that was one of the thoughts I had and the adults tried to teach me is that there is such a thing as a perfect budget. Oh, yeah. That will remove all your problems and you'll be fine in life. 
once you, you get had the budget, a budget right. this wouldn't be a problem if you just had a budget this would be all solved by now yeah and that's not true it's more of how you approach having a budget mm -hmm. and approaching life we have i mean one of the many things that kind of inspired me that you know i still need to talk to my younger self about this is we have a friend who is we will not mention the, specifically who the friend is in part because this friend is actually a few years older than us, though everyone thinks she is even younger than us. Um, and who with their budget is able regularly to, you know, have some savings and is so upset and just doesn't see a point in having savings because invariably something will happen with her car or her house and there goes most of her savings. She has to now or go fix her it. health where, you know, suddenly she's got yeah. to go in for a bunch of tests and stuff. And even though she has insurance, she's still going to have to pay several hundred dollars. And there goes her savings again. She's like, there's just no point in even saving. And I'm like, what? If you're missing the point of the savings, it lets you take care of in a timely manner the problems that could have dragged out for years. Mm-hmm. And that she has kind of confused savings with um, well. future projects savings, mm -hmm. which are two different types. General savings is so that you can take care of your problems. And if you're able to actually address future problems um, way ahead of time. Yeah, like general savings is your rainy day fund. Mm -hmm. You know, that is where you bail yourself out before you're asking other people to bail you out. As well as, how, as well as how you save money in the long term, such as, you know, Glory likes to point out, um, she likes to do Christmas gift buying in July when a several different companies do a lot of their sales because mm -hmm. they this is where they are in the red right now. And so they need to just make some cash flow real quick mm -hmm. and you can get some great deals. Well, specifically you are not going to get in they, October. They need a cash flow in order to purchase to like, um, have certain items manufactured so they can make their Christmas deliveries. So they need that cash flow in the summertime. And so it's a wonderful time to purchase things on sale because all sorts of companies are essentially dealing with a dip in their cash flow. And a lack of cash flow is the number one killer of business. The number two killer is hookers and blow. This is true. But the number one killer of all business, uh, particularly sales type, you know, like retail, in some way, either you're manufacturing items for retail companies or you're actually selling uh, retail whatever it is, somewhere in that chain, their number one business killer is a lack of cash flow. And so if you can get these deals, then you can get these items at, you know, half the cost you would if you have to buy it when you immediately need it. Such as when your, um, when your washing machine breaks. If you know your washing machine has only got a year or two left anyway, and you start looking to replace it, you can get deals throughout the year much better than you can when it actually breaks. You can actually Google this and you can look up any like appliance or kind of item and when is the lowest prices every year traditionally for that. So laptops are very reasonably priced May through July. Really, it's May and June. Uh, because it, at least in America, North America, uh, the school year system, uh, particularly uh, public school, is September to May. So nobody's buying laptops for students in May as the school year ends. They're, they are more like in July and August is when they're like, oh, you need what? Oh, you got to have an extra processing power laptop this year for the new class you've signed up for. Okay, all right, well, we'll buy you a bigger one. So September, the prices, September and October, the prices for laptops jump. But May and June is the lowest prices. And washing machines, the best time to buy washing machines is November because nobody 
is buying washing machines for Christmas, except terrible spouses. Um, so November is a wonderful time to buy a washing machine, washer and dryer sets or just washers, uh, because that is nobody apparently, at least in North America, thinks about washing machines as a great Christmas gift. I do. I think clean clothes are a wonderful Christmas gift. But apparently I am too neurodivergent for words. Uh, by the way, real quick, while it is an awful situation to be in, expenses, I'm currently without any savings because I had three of those savings buster problems popped up back to back to back. And uh, face test. Still, though, congratulations that you had that much savings yes. that you could tackle yeah. not one, not two, but three. Mm -hmm. Like, that is a lot of savings to manage to accomplish. Yeah. And that is not a common situation to hit either, to have so many hit at once. Yeah, I'm one of those very unhelpful people when it comes to talking about budget, because I think this falls under the category for me that... It, it, it's kind of the everything I know in life I learned from Star Trek kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because that episode of Deep Space Nine where Nog is teaching Chief O'Brien about the great material continuum is one of the best ways to understand how to get things done mm -hmm. I have ever seen put together. Because when you're thinking about budget, a lot of this also has to deal with the relationships that you're b b building with people and not just like your friendly relationships, but your prof professional relationships. Because while we like to believe that we are all modern people and all of our economy is monetarily based, oh, honey, no. If you want to have a good life, a lot of your econ economic dealings are going to be doing things in trade. Well, you don't like doing this. I do. So I'm going to do this for you. You could do this for, for me. And do a lot of tra trades that way. Two thirds of the world's economics is on barter. It is yeah. not on. Yeah, it's not money documented. Based. It's almost entirely undocumented barter system. Well, so. I mean, even the international like grain and stuff sales mm -hmm. are actually barter sales. They are not. Well, what was it? There was products. that time where Pepsi had like one of the largest like fighter Navies. jet fleets. Yep. No, just the largest navy. It had like the, the largest, sixth navy, largest navy. Real, in the world. you know, because Russia paid in decommissioned. <laughs> yeah, decommissioned planes That's and right. boats and crap. So I mean, yes, the the planet still primarily works on a barter system. Lean into it. I mean, honestly, whatever financial gains I have gained, I've received in my lifetime almost entirely had to do with bartering with others rather than just cash exchange for goods. And so, yeah. And a lot of people don't realize how much of that trade goes around. So like we occasionally will get food from one of the food banks around here because a friend of ours volunteers there and there are certain kinds of foods they're not allowed to stock mm. that are just on the forbidden list. They either don't store well or nobody will take them. Yeah. Like, so when yeah. those are donated, they are actually instructed by our local food bank to throw them away, which basically means they start calling all of their friends. Hey, somebody made a donation of this. Do you want it? Mm -hmm. And when, when you that, that's what I'm talking about, like setting up these relationships and connections with places where you don't know where various bounties are going to come your way. Mm -hmm. Like. A while back, you might remember us talking about having bison this and bison that. Somebody donated a whole bunch of bison meat to the local food bank. And they don't take anything that's not canned. Like, it has to be canned and preserved. Hmm. So they were like, what are we going to do with all this? Like, we can't do anything with it. Throw it out. So they started calling around to everybody they knew. Do you want, do you like bison? Would you like a bunch of bison meat? If so, come here at this time. And we will load you up. We mm -hmm. so somebody somebody donated a bunch of it, and there are a lot of things like that that really help you. When the, some of those are unexpected windfalls, like like the bison, mm -hmm. for example, but other, others are things that you can kind of count on. We have a lot of friends that garden, and so they are always looking for like. Do you like squash? Time. Yes. Do you like squash? <laughs> I have five billion tomatoes. Do you like tomatoes? Like those, those kinds of reciprocal relationships 
where you know we do stuff for them they do stuff for us that helps float you through a lot of difficult times yeah and I really hate to say this because I am a fairly cynical person, but I have learned over my life not to discount the kindness of people <laughs> and the kindness of strangers, which is really hard for me to say because, yes, a lot of people are crap. But, like, when we moved to California, we had nothing. Like, we were coming from a very bad place. My identity had been stolen. All of our bank accounts had been zeroed out. They we had been settled with a bunch of debt that we could not get cleared because the judge wouldn't prosecute somebody who had a baby. Um, yeah, it was a whole thing. So we got, when we went to Cal moved out to California, we had whatever we could fit in the car, and upon arrival, our neighbors saw that all we had was this little Ford probe <laughs> and a couple things, and like immediately came over. Like, I hear some casseroles that we made. If you can just put this in the oven whenever you guys are hung, hung, hungry. Oh, we also are ordering new furniture and we need to get rid of our old stuff. Like, they can take it if you don't want it. But would you like a couch? We have a couch and a couple chairs. Would you like them? You know, and it's not easy to count on things like that. But if you are open to it, if you are nice to people, this is the really big thing about learning yes, to again, learn. small talk yes small talk. small talk again we want to point out like yes it was a previous episode from this season but small talk is beneficial and when you hear people go oh i hate small talk i don't do small talk what you really hear is they're incompetent at small talk and they have a hard time making and maintaining even the most minor of friendships versus small talk's your friend small talk will save you money Small talk will help you form alliances. Yes. Just talking about the weather. Like, seriously, y'all, there used to be, so when I lived up in Oxford uh, as a teenager, um, our mother published articles in the Ole Miss uh, student newspaper. And you know, she, I mean, she was, I guess, a part-time student. She was able to attend classes for free since she worked at Ole Miss. And Many people, there were only two newspapers in town. One was the Oxford Eagle. Highly suspicious. And the other was the Mississippian, the Ole Miss student newspaper. So a lot of people, including townsfolk, read her articles and really felt like they got to know her. Well, there was this, this older man, this older gentleman. He was a retired professor, probably, slash high school teacher from um, and there. And every time... I would shop at Kroger's because I did, mo as a teenager, I did most of the grocery shopping. When I would come out, often, like, I was waiting for mom or dad to pick me up. Like, I'd literally just go up to the front desk and say, can you call this number and tell them I'm ready for pickup? You know, I'd have all my groceries. And they're like, okay. And I'd go wait outside with the buggy. And this old man, I swear, was there, like, half of the time. And we all we did for two years, two and a half years, was chat about the weather current weather past weather predicted future weather like it was just the like literally shooting the breeze kind of vibe and it wasn't until let's see i was probably 17 or 18 um and he was outside i was grocery shopping inside and someone came and fetched me and said uh that old man who's always outside said you're his friend and he needs you right now he had collapsed in the summer heat and he had seen me walk in and he described me. And so, you know, Kroger's was not that busy at Oxford, Mississippi. And he fetched me and he's like, Hey, can, can you get your ride that always comes right? What are your parents? Could you get them to give me a ride home? I'm not, I don't feel well enough to walk. And I'm like, no problem. Let me uh, go call and I will check out while we wait. Okay. And so he was just sitting on the ground and but as i'm checking out i'm thinking he called me his friend y'all we had only ever talked about the weather literally i knew so much historical weather facts about north mississippi because of this man i did not know before this where he lived and frankly i knew his first name was robert i did not know his last name i just knew he was mr robert because in the south a form of respect is to call them mr or ms or miss and their first name it's a way to show respect 
and familiarity at the same time. And I was just like, it's Mr. Robert or Mr. Bob. Uh, a few people knew him as Mr. Bob, I guess back when he taught high school. But because we had chatted for two and a half years, and I said so, on the way to his house, my mom picked me up and we got him in there with a the little bit of groceries I had already had and took him home because he had heat exhaustion is what happened. And I was like, you know, at first I didn't know who they were talking about when they came to fetch me because they said, a man says you're his friend and he needs you out there. And I'm like, who, who? I didn't know we were friends. And he's like, well, we've been talking for two and a half years. I figure we should be friends by now. And I'm like, and I just sat there for a moment. I was like, I do think of you as a friend. Yes, Mr. Robert. I'm glad that you had them fetch me. But that's all it took, y'all, was just chatting about the weather and nothing yeah. else. He just it's talked true. about all his like most amazing tornadoes he ever witnessed in his life and the most amazing hailstorms. You don't know hailstorms like the past hailstorms. But yes, I mean, in Mississippi, we can get hail the size of tennis balls, which when you see that and you see a hailstorm destroy a roof, it is impressive. And, you know, I was young and I didn't know about that yet. So he was the one who told me about it. Um, but apparently he actually used to teach meteorology and cloud formation at one point in his lifetime. And so he knew all these weather facts because that was his job. To answer CB's question from the chat, oh, home economics is the worst taught subject and it should be a required. It yes. should be a required. It was, it was specifically removed along with civics to make people more beholden to the government and less self-reliant. Yes, because home economics teaches you how to sew basic clothing. Home economics teaches you how to cook basic nourishing meals. Home economics teaches you even how to do basic gardening, both pleasure gardening, i.e., you know, pretty flowers and things, and utilitarian practical gardening, like growing vegetables. But you see, if you grow vegetables then you are not beholden to the government supply chain or the capitalist supply chain for your nourishment. You're like, I could just quit this job and just eat off of my garden until I find a better job that treats me with respect. And nobody with money and power wants you to think that. Hence the whole, oh, every decade or so, this, um, again, going to the media of nobody wants to work. And the answer is, oh, they want to work. They just don't want to work without being adequately, you know, compensated. They will know, you know, all of a sudden people go, I'm tired of working for, you know, literal um, starvation wages. It's not mm -hmm. worth it. I will put my effort into something else. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'd rather starve on my own time. Tom, could you close your room door? Yeah. Brian got to throw that into some local businessman's face because they were complaining about how nobody wants to work anymore and blah, 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 blah. And he just pointed at the stack of resumes mm -hmm. on his desk that even when we're not hiring, people still show up and want, want to work, work for us because, you know, it's not like we're so great. It's just we believe that people should be paid for their labor and have a voice in what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we treat our employees like humans and the word got out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the. Reagan did so much wrong to our country and Thatcher in the UK, mm -hmm. but a lot of these reforms that took home economics out came under both, both of them because yeah. they were trying to figure out how to stop the sixties from happening again. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of do documents <laughs> where they are talking about this. Oh, hi, Chris. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of documents where they're talking about this and how they can basically keep people from being in control of their life enough to yeah, organize. corporations and the yeah. and all the governments do not want you to feel that you are in charge of your own destiny and that you can take care of your basic human needs for at least a short period that you are not entirely reliant on corporations and the government they do not want you to feel that way they do not want you to feel that you have agency and autonomy and so Again, budgeting is an act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Budgeting is it a, is an act of an anti-capitalist act to say, no, I'm going to take care of me and whenever possible, 
my friends and family, all my loved ones. And that means, yeah, you garden a little bit extra. You, you garden more than the food you need because that way you have enough to share so you can help other people out. Or in Mississippi, what is known as the zucchini burglar, but it's like a reverse burglar. So what happens is zucchini grows all summer here. It loves the heat and the humidity. And the leaves, zucchini plant leaves, grow huge, and they hide the zucchini. So think of, like, a much larger man's form. Tom, show me your forearm. Show them your big old Popeye arm. Yes, but bigger. Think of zucchini that big, y'all. And that is not an exaggeration. And then they'll take them and put them all in the T-shirt bags, you know, the grocery store bags. And they will just leave them on random people's doorsteps in the night, in the early morning before people wake up. Oh, the zucchini has been dropped off. And now you are burdened with, you know, five to ten pounds of monster zucchini. And that is, um, you know, miss, this is the version of Mississippi pranks. But, you know, uh, we pranked you by feeding you. Good luck. <laughs> Remember, they fry great. But, yeah, like, that... That is part of why, no, you don't hear as much about budgeting being taught. Because right. Because it is anti-capitalist. It, you know, it ruins their ability to control every action somebody makes. Well, especially mm -hmm. neoliberal capitalism, which requires people to be in debt. Mm -hmm. like, this is a major change that most of the people listening to our voices grew up after this change happened. So if you don't have like conscious memories of the 80s when this transition was yeah, you going wouldn't hard, know. It's it's hard to remember a time when the idea of accruing debt, having credit cards, but just having so much debt just as a natural part of how you live your life doesn't it seems so natural now because it has been naturalized mm -hmm. in the way that we run our our day-to-day -day lives. But there was a time in this country where it was a sh it was considered almost shameful to have mm -hmm. debt. Like it was something that people, the, I, I remember the first time I saw an advertisement for, I think it was a visa card or it was our American express on TV. And I was in the room with like a bunch of family members. And I remember my grandmother gasping, like who would willingly get a card to get or to, to get debt. Like she was just so aghast. Mm -hmm. At the idea that you would have a credit card, that that was yes. just not, that it was just so far beyond her ken. And I remember her and my parents and a couple of my aunts that were there just talking about this, like, yeah, they're really pushing this idea that everybody should have credit cards. And like, I don't understand why, like, we're trying to pay off the mortgage. We're trying to pay off the car loan. Like, that's too much debt, you know? Why I would remember my grandma that? who was born in 1913. Uh, and also scandalized. And like, I remember her long distance calls to my parents in the mid to late 80s, again, about the same commercials of, can you believe? Like, and dad pointing out, but mom, you've had plenty of department store credit cards. And her saying, yes, but that was not that much. And just, you know, to till payday. That wasn't we didn't spend enough where it takes you a year to pay off what you charged at the at the department store. It my was grandmother's term to for buy that the was kids clothes for school. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, my grandmother's term for that was, but those were short-term layaway. Yeah, exactly. I got, it, I got to take it home with me, but I paid yes. it by the end of the month. Yes, that was and that was Grandma Marty's point too of, but what is this like you're supposed to go on vacation and charge all of it to a card and then you spend the rest the next year paying it off? This is just how can you live this way? You'll have nothing left by the time you have to retire. You know, like I remember yeah. these, she was genuinely upset and alarmed that people might be living this way. She had a point though, also because she only called dad. She, she'd seen the commercial. So she called up MasterCard or whatever visa, whatever it was, and had them ship her the information. And then she's like doing the maths on the APR and stuff. And she's like, 
this is highway robbery. How is this even illegal? And y'all, it was back when it was the APR was 17%. Yeah. Um, you know, that now was the high APR. That was, yes. And she just was scandalized. Now I've seen APRs upwards of almost 40%, which again, yeah. that should be illegal. Uh -huh. But that was, she was just absolutely scandalized of how can anybody save for their retirement if they're doing this and dad going, well, a fool and his money are soon parted. And that's why like home economics should really be taught. People need to understand what that APR number means. They and in home economics, they used to teach this, by the yes. way. Yes. Because um, where I got my education degree in that program, it was adjacent to the home economics department. Um, they were sort of, they weren't, they were, you know, like sister programs. They weren't together. However, um, home economics hosted the best events. So all of us, you know, future teachers would go, we'd always like get notices uh, in our building for all the home economic events that were open to the public. And we'd go because the food was always great. And frankly, the decorations were great. The music was great, you know, because home ec sure knows how to throw a party. And but like, yeah, so I've seen their curriculum. Um, we were, our program was actually involved in the home economics curriculum since my degree is actually in curriculum planning. If you have not noticed I, I in the way of these podcasts and how the seasons fold out, you might not have guessed that that is literally what my degree it is planning curriculum. <laughs> But we were involved in that. And yes, I noticed, I was very happy to notice that the home economics programs at all ages, I think it was like up starting in fifth grade, started going over how to discern good credit card programs versus opportunistic, dangerous ones. And I was very pleased that they were starting to go over it with 10 year olds of but how can you evaluate, learning how to evaluate um, all sorts of potential debt situations and what is a good choice versus a bad choice? Yeah, I was very lucky because I went, as I've talked about before, I went to a magnet school, high school for, for uh, art, for the arts. And so they really worried about all of us, like with our dreams of being dancers and actors and artists and photographers and, you know, writers and translators and whatnot, like, oh, y'all just don't understand. There's no future for you. So we actually had a robust home economics class at our, at our school that was, I think, designed to scare us into finding something more practical that we wanted to do. But like they made us do amortization tables yes. in home ec because we had to understand how our debt changed over time. So when we had to do a pretend budget, we also had to figure out how our debt what grew over time. Like we had to actually fill out an amortization table to show how the debt goes up over time, how making payments at certain times actually affect the debt and change the way the interest on it goes up and everything. Like they really were trying to scare us into, please, please don't try to be an artist, please. Please, <laughs> we know that we're here to help you like fulfill your artistic joy, but go to college you get a real job <laughs> please, please honestly that is what i really enjoyed about the quicken um home version back in the early to mid 2000s was it contained all of these amortization calculators yep so i could plug in without it affecting my actual budget i could set up a, a separate and plug in all these like ideas of like okay well, this credit card plan is this. What if I, and okay. And it says they give credit limits of 300 to 3000. Okay. So what if, how long would it take me to pay off? La la la. Cause it would even tell you the projected minimum payments. And what if you paid maximum and, and all these other, like you just keep playing forever. And again, that's what I have been encouraging everyone to do. Uh, Cause there's also a simpler versions of those kind of calculators available for free online. So you just play with all this of uh, what is it going to actually be like paying off a 30 year <laughs> mortgage? What are you actually paying versus a 15 year mortgage versus you just saving up and purchasing a smaller, cheaper house with cash? 
which like in Mississippi is possible since we have not had as much of the uh, financial development problems that most larger states have experienced where uh, they're using, they're buying all the residential properties and holding them because they um, are able to write it off as a loss and able to launder more money that way. So that's why, what is it? Two thirds of all residential homes lay empty in America. Yep. It's yep. because they're being held to by financial investment groups in order to launder dirty money from all over the world. And this is something that is so vital to a lot of our lives because I, I don't believe a lot of the scare tactics that are out there about how many people are falling out of the economy and stuff like that. The economy is changing and people are, there are a lot of side economies that are not showing up under the neoliberal metrics that are being uh, yeah. mo monitored. So I, I don't believe all of the hype of people are dropping out of the jo job market. No, they're doing other things. Those other things may be legal. They may be part of the, uh, oh, I just lost the word. Um, well, I know economy. that the gig economy, yeah, or the gray economy, um, where it's only somewhat above board or, you know, not everything gets reported. So, for instance, if somebody does lawn work, and they're paid cash, it's very difficult for the government to prove that they did not file their taxes on the cash they're paid. Versus if they're paid by check or they're paid, you know, through various online banking such as Venmo and Cash App, that is somewhat traceable. But again, it's not totally traceable. <coughs> so it's, that's why it's called gray economy. It's, there's black market, there's gray economy, and then there's what is considered, you know, part of the mainstream economy. Because really the whole point in all of this is like just keeping your head above water. Like, I, I really would love to say that this is about, like learning to budget is about learning to save and getting ready for your retirement. But a lot of the way the economy is structured right now, it's about mere survival yeah. <laughs> it's just about keeping your head above water so that you can just keep ch chugging on and there are a lot of creative ways to do that that will get you to where you're wanting to go if you are willing to put in the work and effort <laughs> to do it because I, I i will say you know i remember like california was one of those radicalizing moments for me because we were living out there during the FERC energy crisis mm. when like you mm. woke up the next morning and your electric bill was like $3,000 because they suddenly decided to j jack up prices on everything. Um, Cause George W. Bush hated California and wanted to punish us. And like jobs were evap evaporating. It was a very hard time to get by for, many years and a lot of us ended up leaving the state that's how i ended up where i am right now but in that time period like you learn how to stretch everything out and that's the other side of budgeting because when people think about budgets they're often thinking about money but you also need to be thinking about in terms of food like when we were struggling out there we lived not that far away from an um, indian grocer so we could get giant bags of basmati rice, really cheap, really cheap. And it is a, it is a healthy grain. It has a lot of nu nutrients in it that you need to survive. And a little bit of it fluffs up a lot with water. Mm -hmm. So a little bit makes a lot of food. And so, you know, we, when we're thinking about bu budget, it's not just what can we afford, but it's what is the what are those things that are going to be able to stretch? What are those things that are going to be able to fill all of the niches that we need? So we were living off of basmati rice. We were not that far from a place where we could get very inexpensive chicken 
bits. So Brian and I would share a breast of chicken mm-hmm. and bas- basmati rice. And then our splurge, our guilty ple- pleasure was buying really cheap spices at the Indian market that we could add just a little bit to your food and now it has flavor. So even though we were just eating chicken and rice for every meal or just plain rice for every meal, you just put a little little dash of the spice in it and it's a different flavor. A little dash of that spice in it and it's a different flavor. Mm-hmm. And that kind of budgeting is another thing that really isn't taught in a lot of places. Like this is something that I grew up with because my grandparents lived through the Great Depression and they taught my parents how to survive the next Great Depression. And my mother like beat this into me, like the idea of like not having a pantry of like, oh, canned beans are on sale right now. Buy all of them. (laughs) Just get them all. They will. They won't go bad. They're shelf stable. We'll eventually get through them. But should the worst happen, we're stocked up on canned green beans or what have you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's how I was raised and learning to work your budget that way so that you are future proofing yourself as much as you can here, there and yonder, having those shelf stable items that you can just have learning how to make your own soaps, how to make your own, just about everything. So if needs be, you can fill in that niche for the things that you can't afford, but still need for survival. And it re- these really are vi- vital skills, especially as the economy is cranking over, because whether we like it or not, like the big scare they're trying to get to do is AI is coming for your jobs. AI is not coming for your jobs. Automation is, though. Automation is getting to the point where in a lot of industries, it is cheaper and more mm-hmm. consistent for McDonald's to have a robot flipping burgers mm-hmm. than to have a person back there flipping burgers. And let's be honest, when it's... 10 o'clock and you got that angry person in drive through I'm more comfortable knowing a robot's flipping my burger than some angry team that's ticked off that's going to probably do something to it because I was hungry and wanted a quick bite on the way home. Mm-hmm. And so they're incentivized to do this kind of automation. And that means we are yet again going to have to change our economic models. What that's going to look like, I don't know. Everybody knows I like an UBI. I like the idea of that. It's worked well in Alaska for a long time, even though they don't like mm-hmm. calling it a UBI. But they have a UBI in Alaska. It worked great during the yeah. I mean, there's a UBI in Alaska. There's ones in Saudi. There's yeah. one in, there's, in several Scandinavian countries. Of, Yeah. Yeah, that is not something that the capitalists want. The ones who are, who want people to work for below, mm-hmm. you know, a sustainable wage. Yep. And, you know, the whole, I always love the, if you raise minimum wage, though, what about all those businesses that can't pay that wage and, you know, maintaining profitability? It's like, then they weren't profitable to begin with. They were just mm-hmm. relying on the government. Yes. Yeah. You know, without admitting it to, mm-hmm. you know, sustain them and to fund them anyway. Walmart is not actually a sustainable business. Nope. They rely on the government to pay their employees about half their wages because they cover all of their health needs. Walmart doesn't. The mm-hmm. government has to pick up that tab. Yep. Because anybody who knows me knows I like my creature comforts. I like my technologies. I'm not a let's all move out to the to the woods and start homesteading kind of person because I have bad knees and a bad back, and oh god, I hate the heat. But we do need to start figuring out a certain level of self-sufficiency, just because periods of economic change are rough. Because mm-hmm. you have to get to a breaking point where people realize, oh, okay, fine, we have to change things, and people don't like doing that, especially the the powered interests. And so, as you're thinking about how you're going to spend your money, how you're going to use your money, how you're going to set up your pantry, because pantries are very much a part of budget. You know, be be thinking about how are you going to be future-proofing yourself? Because, I don't know, like I said, this may just come from the fact that most of my family were, you know, really, like, stuck in that Depression era. Like, the worst, the next Dust Bowl is on the horizon. <laughs> like... 
live in fear, be afraid all the time. But, you know, having yourself set up as much as you can to weather whatever storms are coming your way is the best budgeting that you can do. And that will mean very different things for like those of you up in the colder climates in Michigan where you have to worry about if something bad happens, how do we heat this house? Because we cannot go without heat when there's nine feet of snow outside the front door, <laughs> front door right? So it's it, it can't be a, a, a one size fits all because the differences between what you need in California or Michigan are going to be different. But really, I mean, like last night we were talking about, you know, a friend of ours in Michigan whose kid will soon become a teenager. And yep. what happens when boys become teenagers and the hunger? And the new economics, the new family economics of how do you feed a teenager and without them just eating out your entire pantry and now no, there's no food in the house. Mm -hmm. And after thinking about it and talking about it, especially as long as the eggs are cheap, I was realizing the two best meals to keep a teenager fed of, you know, just economically is either some form of spaghetti and sauce or fried rice mm -hmm. yep. because you can just do you know scrambled eggs in rice with a bit of flavorings and that will give mm -hmm. your your teenager all the protein and carbs they need mm -hmm. and a reasonable amount of fat for all the stuff their body needs and they will mm -hmm. be happy you can even fit some vegetables in there if you've got them so they'll stay regular against their will <laughs> but of of everyone's different, every economic situation is different and you have to adapt whenever something changes. As you get older, as your kids get older, economics change of how often do you need clothes? How often is your clothing size going to change? You know, as Spence was saying about the underground baby clothes. Yes, the baby underground baby clothes market. Of because babies change clothes fast. Every couple months, you got to change their clothes. Weeks. Every couple weeks. Oh, my God. And remember mom's story of when I was born, I gained a pound a week. Can I just say this? First several months. And she, people were like, what are you feeding her? She's like, I'm just breastfeeding her. And everybody, even the doctor was like, no, but seriously, what are you feeding her? This is why <laughs> in olden days, all babies wore dresses. Yeah. Like, why? When you look back at old pictures and all of the babies are in dresses up until like they're and, almost a teenager. And even the boys wore shorts. They did not wear full oh, length pants. They put boys little dresses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. no but, but, but even when they had short, even when they had, oh, yeah. you know, those little sailor outfits and stuff on, oh, they had God. shorts. They did not have long pants. No, you don't get long pants until seven to ten years old, depending on the. And time even then, period. not that many because you'll outgrow them so quick. It's yep. not worth investing. It's in even them. part of the storyline in Auntie Maine is yes. when Patrick finally gets long pants. You know, I think he's like thirteen or something insane. And, it, and I, you know, and I love. <laughs> but Everett, I mean, like, um, I mean, it's fiction, but yeah. Of ever also bring yeah. up like this is part of the things you teach your kids for their future for economic stability yeah. is you know ever it's like I'm so thankful that I always went grocery shopping with my mom growing up mm -hmm. it taught me how to make food stretch and feed your family with a small budget it's really helped Ooh. me and Everett bond uh, early uh, in our friendship was like all of Everett's best recipes were all like so freaking cheap. It was wonderful. And yes, right now he's still got a teenage boy at home. And uh, oh, well, thankfully that teenage boy is working at a pizza place. Yeah, so whatever when, pizza I found out. It, yeah, whenever it told me like, oh, he's working at a pizza place this summer, and I'm like, oh, thank God, because he could eat all the leftover pizzas there. And Everett's like, yes, it's going to be such a relief. <laughs> I grew up with so much oats in our ground beef that gra pure ground beef tastes weird to me. Yeah, because that, that that was the stretch. I actually the prefer the texture of ground beef with oats in it because I I think it actually gives it better texture. But yes, it will also stretch it out. Yep. Just rotate down the six month clothes for them. Yep. They grow so quickly. 
I knew one woman who had a very, he came out, the baby came out long and he just kept getting longer. We called him the noodle baby. And one time she's like, literally in two weeks, he grew a whole inch because he was sick. So they took, she took him to the doctor and they were like, well, we're going to go ahead and measure him. Uh, and, you know, do all the normal checkup stuff. And then she went two weeks later for his normal checkup. And he had grown a whole freaking inch, a baby, an infant. He was like barely crawling. And he grew a whole inch in, one, in two weeks. And I'm like, that is a noodle baby. He's just all legs and arms. She's like, he really is. Like, how is this even? But, yeah, they grow. They grow so freaking fast. So, like, just put them all in dresses. There's no point. There's no point. But also, but, like, that is why part of budgeting is also getting a grasp on what your needs are. It's not just, you know, can you pay your bills? It's what do I actually need every month? Mm -hmm. So like what kind of foods do you need every month to stay fed and happy? Cake. Because bad food makes it hard to do everything cake. else. I need cake at least once a month. I will rebel if I don't get cake. She really does need cake. It is. It's an interesting thing. Lori's need cake. It doesn't like have to be great person. cake. It could just be good cake. Okay. And it like, and like, one of the things I have been taught with Glory's Friday um, dinners Dinner is party, that right. if I am oddly, if I am honest, I do not care that much about main course. It especially not desserts. I just care that there is a soup and salad. Mm -hmm. I you. never guessed that about myself. Thankfully, I'm naturally, apparently, very good at making soup and salad. <laughs> so he's always happy. And then it's my responsibility to make sure I have the dessert I want or a dessert. So, yes, when in doubt, ice cream will cover the bill. But, I mean, but once you know what your food and dietary needs, and at some point later, I will be, will be and sad. And later on this, and later on this um, season, I will be catch us for the changing your body physique episode and i will talk about all the cost of foods and what are your how to figure out your body's actual nutrient needs so that everyone can change you know can keep the body they want or you know adjust to the body they want without having to hurt themselves but like i have i noticed i will be genuinely sad if i don't have cake at least once a month so anyway, I you have, have a lot of people that. who agree with you glory Cake is life. It is. I will be genuinely sad if I don't eat cake at least once a month. And it has to be a good cake if it's once a month. It can be mediocre cake if it's every week. I have a thing for cobblers. Oh, cobblers are good too. Cobblers are good. Yeah, something with, with a streusel topping or a crum, crum, crumble yeah. topping on top. Like just fruit with some kind of a oh. baked buttery yum on top. Tom likes apple pie with a streusel topping, so I sometimes do those, and they really do just hit the frickin' spot. Yeah, Megan needs lemons. I get that. CB needs smoked sausage at least three times a week with pasta or something. Exactly. Figuring out what you need, both psychologically and physically, in order to not feel sad. It's important to get to know your body and your mind about what you need to not feel deprived. Um, cause again, like our stepmother, when nested, she's the one, our stepmother actually is the one who taught me how to do the quote unquote austerity budget. Oh God. Do you remember the austerity? Oh, oh it's yeah. going to be a rough time in the, at the home for the next three months. Cause she, you know, she had a one month austerity budget and a three month austerity budget that it was, you know, essentially all hands on deck. We've got to, you know, we're trying to avoid financial ruin. And, but I hated the austerity budget and the moment we could afford something special. So in the Philippines, it would be one of the really lovely fruits. Philippines grows fruit like nobody's business. The best fruits in the world are grown in the Philippines. Seriously, I'll die on this hill. So yeah, it's just like, we can we afford a good durian or some jackfruit, something nice, a little special? We're literally talking a couple pesos. It's nothing. But as soon as the austerity budget could allow, that would be our budgetary splurge was the equivalent of just literally a few dollars uh, to buy like one of the really choice. 
big pieces of fruit so we could all have it for a special dinner dessert thing. Um, and oh boy, like when I say, imagine a table with 12 people there and everybody's eating a literal plate full of some delicious fruit. Like they're eating a lot. Like it's that, like that would be the splurge. And boy, did we look forward to it. But knowing what is the splurge. Now, once the austerity budget was over, it was what ice cream are we going to get? Because in the Philippines, that is the celebration food. Uh, at least, uh, come on, internet. Come Magnolia. on. Yeah, it's, uh, that is the celebration food is ice cream. And, oh, as soon, everybody asks, is the austerity, are we through the austerity budget yet? Oh, every month it's like, oh, how long more? How long till we uh, catch up at whatever financial, uh, you know? And as soon as the austerity budget, literally, it would be like, okay, I think we'll be out of the clear in a week, maybe two weeks. And then it would be like a countdown. And then it would be like within three days, it would be like, all right, everybody, start figuring out what ice cream we are all going to agree to get. And it would be a gallon of Magnolia ice cream. And like the whole gallon would be gone by the end of the night when we'd get it. And that was the celebration. The austerity budget is complete. That was the celebration. And I still have so many fond memories of ube ice cream because that was my favorite, which is that purple yam. Um, that was my favorite was the ube. There was also so many other wonderful ones. But it was a true party. Everyone had a big bowl of ice cream. And we would eat that. And it was just so happy. And I highly recommend if you do have to go to a austerity budget, like the kind that, you know, several people in the chat and we've talked about where, you know, you are on, you're just eating rice and beans kind of deal, whatever you're doing to get by. As soon as that's over, you should already be thinking before that budget ends, how are we going to celebrate the end of the austerity budget? Because... Mm -hmm. To what do emotionally resilient people do is they never miss an opportunity to celebrate the triumphs and the, you know, all the successes, including we've reached our goal. We've, we have completed our austerity budget measures and we are back to regular budget. So we're going to have a little celebration. And what is our little celebration? Maybe it'll be, you know, a triple layer cake with the frosting and everything. Maybe it will be your favorite expensive ice cream or something else, you know? Maybe somebody's going to drive all the way out to the county to get a watermelon from the best watermelon grower in your state. Whatever. Already know ahead of time what that celebration is going to be because it's important to celebrate all the opportunities as they come your way. Even if you don't feel like celebrating them. Go ahead and do it. That is what emotionally resilient people do. And you don't have to feel it to reap the benefits of emotional resilience. Oh, the Smith County watermelons are finally coming in. Oh, thank God. Y'all, there's no watermelons on this planet like Smith County watermelons. I'm so sorry that the rest of y'all do not have your own Smith County watermelons. And I heard the Chilton peach Crop this year is terrible. So I'm so sorry. But the Smith County watermelons. Oh, there's magic in that soil. Or probably a lot of dead things. It's fine. It's delicious. I don't care. On that note, we're going to take a little breaky break. Yep. So when we come back, what are we going to talk about? Anybody got thoughts? What do you want to talk about? The hidden portex of uh, oh, buying God. cheap things instead of quality things. Mm -hmm. It's the quickest way to ruin a budget. Yes, let's. It's the second hour. Time for here's the rough parts. Or as I like to think of it, anything you purchase at Fred's. So not wrong. If you yeah. know, you know. There's only one, there's only a few things I've ever purchased at Fred's that were worth the money. One of them was uh, a cat bed. I've had so many animals now 
sleep in that cat bed for the last 20 something years. It was definitely worth the $10. And Fred's is the best place to get ball jars. It's the cheapest, best, most reliable source of canning jars. Um, cause everywhere else overcharges for their jars when they get it and they go, they, and they, they only do a one-time order of jars each year rather than a continual one versus Fred's orders every time. So you can reliably get ball jars. And those are the only two things worth buying at Fred's everything else. Oh, we're going to have to replace this soon. Truly the poverty tax. All right. Well, now would be a lovely time. Make sure you got something to eat. Check in with your bladder. And I bet it's snack time. I'm willing to bet if you check in with your stomach, you'll find out. Snack time. We'll see you on the other side.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. Ten minutes is not a long time. It really isn't, is it? I like, I sprinted. I made myself another cup of coffee. Nom, nom, nom. And Tom got donut holes. Delicious, fantastic donut holes. Hello, welcome. <laughs> I love mason jars, and then gentrification happened. I am currently drinking out of mason jars. I mean, they are actually strong glass mm -hmm. containers, so you don't have to worry about them breaking. They are far more resistant to temperature change than even regular, quote-unquote, glasses. <laughs> CB, you are probably not alone in that one. Mm -hmm. Simply, mm, donuts. They're quite delightful. But yeah, of the, so what Charlie was alluding to is um, when you have to, because necessity says you need certain things to go operate in your daily life. You need shoes. You probably need socks. You need shirts. Nice. You need feet. You it's need, very hard you know, to, it's unsafe to put your, your prescription glasses on the floor next to your bed. That's not a great idea. So you need a nightstand, but you can't afford a nightstand. Time to go to Fritz. And the upside is you have what you need. You can use it. The downside is it will not last nearly as long as if you spent twice as much in many cases. So there is the trade-off of getting what you need immediately to go about your daily life and what you can invest in so you don't have to get it again. I mean, it's even like why you get good quality shoes, let alone if you really can, you need two to three pairs of shoes that you switch out so mm -hmm. you do not wear any particular pair of shoes more than twice in a week mm -hmm. and never twice in a row. Because yep. when you do that, each of those shoes will last two to three times as long just because the materials have time to um, relax and come back to themselves. And they're not under constant stress, like if you wear them every day in a row. According to the Italian leather shoe company I work for, they'll last 10 times as long as, as if you don't wear them every day. So like if you just have three pairs of shoes you can switch out, you could have them all for a decade versus mm -hmm. one pair of shoes you've got for a year, maybe two max before they're just worn out. There's nothing left on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we talk about with the poor tax of the, if you're poor and you cannot afford to get enough of stuff, it will simply wear out faster. It will not last as long to begin with. And that is where it can be hard and difficult to get yourself out of, you know, debt and out of always having to spend and not being able to save for anything. And that's where it's really important to learn what to splurge on and what not to. Also, places where you can delay spending. Uh -huh. So, something uh, most people, even down here in South Mississippi, I've talked to do you not realize there are not one but two shoe repair shops in our town. And you don't have to just have nice church shoes for them to repair. They will repair your sneakers. Now, will it look identical? Maybe not. But, like, especially if you, like, the sole is flapping. Have you ever had that? 
where like the soul is flapping or something like that, they can fix that. And uh, they can also clean it up, make it look like much newer than it is. Uh, also, purse problems, sheer pair shops can fix most of your purse problems. Mm -hmm. Whether the strap is broken or it's uh, a bunch of the leather on the bottom and on the sides has frayed away um, or worn off. They can actually fix that. I did not know you could fix that. I was like, wait, what? Or if you're of a certain age and you have a duster, if you have a large, heavy-duty jacket, the shoe repair shop is actually the place you go to who has the equipment that can repair it. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised how low cost it is to repair it. Oh my God. They really don't charge much because they can get that stuff in bulk. It doesn't cost them as much. And they have mm -hmm. the equipment, so it doesn't take them much time at all. There's we're talking literal minutes for them that would take you hours mm -hmm. to days to fix. So, yes, I've had, I've, I have had church shoes where literally I wore through the sole uh, on the ball of the foot. And it was like, I can't afford to buy nice shoes, but I, I have an upcoming thing I need to, I have to attend for work take it in there like is there anything you, i just have to wear it for a work event is there anything you could do so i don't have to because like i could barely my my feet are big on top like i would not say fatty it's just my foot is big and many uh dress shoes are tight on the top uh of my foot so I could, I tried and I couldn't even fit a piece of cardboard in where the hole in the sole was. I couldn't fit both my foot and the cardboard piece in there. It wouldn't fit. Yeah. And so I took my shoes to the shoe repair shop and I explained what happened. And I have a work event coming up. I'm like, is there anything at all you can do that's like not going to cost an arm and a leg or take three weeks? And they're like, well, let's see. They went and checked to make sure they had a replacement sole that would fit that shoe. And they literally had me fixed up for three whole dollars in 10 minutes. Because they're like, do the soles have to match? Because it'll be six dollars to change both. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> because <laughs> who's, why are people checking out the bottom of my feet? That is not important. Uh, I don't, it's so three whole dollars and 10 minutes where I just hung around and put two pennies in the, the gumball chickle machine. You know what I'm talking about? Those little chickles for a penny eat. Why? It's still a penny. Um, and, and waited for him to fix the shoe. And then, sh and I, he's like, look, the heel on this other one is going to go pretty soon. And I'm like, okay, I have no money. Like, I literally had pulled all the change on the floor of my car in order to pay him the $3. And I said, but I promise I will come back after payday and have you fix it right. Whatever you want, as long as it's under $20. <laughs> and he's like, okay. And um, I brought them back at the end of the month when I got paid. Oh, and he only charged me $14 to just totally rehaul those shoes. Y'all... Those shoes went from, I was about to literally throw them out to, for a total of $17, people thought that I had bought nice, new, classy shoes. Because he he totally re-oiled the leather on the tops. He absolutely, he, he touched up all the color on the leather so it looked bright again. And everything, I didn't ask it, he just, I was like, whatever, under 20 I mean, yes, this was about I thought 15, I was going to have to buy, ago. huh? This was about 15, 20 years ago. I thought I was, well, it wasn't even, it was, yeah, it was about, uh, it was about 13 years ago. I thought I was going to have to go to pay less and buy new shoes for $20. And so that was like, if you can fix it for less than $20, it's fine. So, yes, you can revitalize shoes. I really felt like even, so on the, one of the, of these two dress shoes, I kind of roll my ankle a little bit and a little piece of the leather had come undone from the sewing. And so like, 
I could feel the ground out of like the corner near my pinky toe. And he even fixed all of that. Like literally he totally revitalized these shoes and it took him, uh, you know, a day. So again, I want to point out there are more options than people realize. Also, yeah, after spending $70 on a really crappy nightstand and it not even surviving uh, 18 months, you better believe the next time I needed a nightstand, I went to Cowboy Maloney when it was still around. It's a, was it appliance store? Yeah. And I went there and I was like, hey, is there any chance you happen to have any extra like appliance boxes in the back? Uh, and they're like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm like, I need to essentially make myself a nightstand out of a box for a couple months till I can afford to buy a nightstand. Could you please help me out? And they're like, oh, you just need a nightstand size. But oh, let's go see. Let's go see in the back what we got. And they gave me enough for a matching set of nightstands. And they're like, but what are you going to do? Like, if you put a lamp on it, and I was like, I am going to literally reinforce this thing with shipping tape. I'm going to reinforce it inside and out with shipping tape and I'm going to make drawers for it out of more cardboard and that will get me through for six months. And I'm going to use, and yes, I did use actual chopsticks to connect so that each of the drawers could sit on the chopsticks that we're poking through. And that is what I used to make myself the most hokey disposable nightstand and never under a sleep. Tell you something. Or... That nightstand, literally, someone else asked, Look, don't throw that away. Let call me up before you throw it away. I think I could do something with that. I'll paint it. Right? Okay. Do you know how long that night my little set of hokey nightstands survived? I had them for about 14 months. And they were just made out of tiny little appliance boxes. I think what they were microwave boxes or something. And they lived at someone else's house, repainted. Literally, she spray painted them. Oh, and she put gold finish and she stenciled them. And they survived not less than three years, which I want to point out the $70 nightstand I bought from Fred's only lasted 18 months. So hmm. this nightstand made out of appliance boxes, shipping tape, and chopsticks lasted twice as long. Longer, actually, almost three times as long as the official furniture that you know the poor are to buy so at you our, have options at our old uh apartment back in california we wanted ottomans because we didn't have any recliners and no financial means to you know put our feet up other right. than to go You're lay down on your feet all the time so we started saving up our coffee cans and put coffee cans and some pillows together and made all of the ottomans that we had and mm -hmm. they were so much more comfortable than some of the more the ones we actually mm -hmm. paid, paid for yep <clears throat> yeah there are a lot of ways that you can put stuff together but like i was say, saying a while ago never underestimate the power of a good yard sale because most of mm -hmm. the actual furniture that we have in our house is stuff that we picked up yard selling and we've had for like 20 years because the people that had it before us had it for 20 years because it was solidly constructed and made it through. And you don't have to be a wizard with wood to be able to look at something and go, hey, that's actually solid. Because the big thing that you're looking for is the difference between so something that's solid wood construction and that fiberboard. Mm -hmm. that solid wood stuff will last forever as long um, as you treat it well. This recliner, I realize the leather looks like crap. It's all flaking off. It's terrible. But Tom got this recliner. It's a set. It's like a love seat set. On the side of the road, down the road, and dragged this thing on the asphalt all the way here by himself. And because he knew not to even come and get me because it was way too heavy because it's got solid wood framing. Because he knew to check underneath. It had solid wood and steel springs, so he knew this would actually last. I have no intention of throwing this thing out, even though, yeah, the leather's all flaking. I do have an intention of reupholstering her because the bone. Hmm? What? And even if you can't afford to do that, chair covers exist. 
that yes. are fairly inexpensive. True. Or we put blankets. We have just blankets. We used to, uh, my parents used to put uh, Goodwill sheets, you know? Yeah. The either the flats or the fitted, you'd be surprised. Fitted actually will fit a bunch of couches pretty well. Yep. Um, like, yeah, they don't necessarily look super pretty. I mean, if you want to get fancy, you can then add a ruffle to it. Anyway, that's a whole nother matter. But like, yeah, I'm going to one day reupholster it. And in the meantime, I may recover it with a sheet that I tack down with some uh, needle and thread to the, to, to the fabric. But not once. Every time I, I pull out, I, I, I pull the, the lever so the, the leg rest comes out. Not once does it wiggle or in any way give me any indication that it's wearing out. That is how good the construction of the bones of this thing is. And ditto for our other couch and love seat set that we actually bought from Cheryl and Everett. And I can't remember who they got it from. It is, look, I love, these couches have survived forever. The fabric is ugly as homemade sin. But when you look underneath it, the reason why I actually said, yeah, I'll take those, was I looked underneath and it was solid hardwood construction. And so I knew I could reupholster it, I can cover it, but the thing is not going to fall apart. And that's what matters. And it's a steel also, hide -a bed. Yeah, and it's honestly surprisingly comfortable for how much neglect and abuse it has actually received. Also, quite honestly, in truth, just about every one of my friends who knows my house address who's been here has slept on the, the bigger of the two couches. We haven't even necessarily pulled out the hide -a bed but they've just slept on it. And not a person has actually complained. They're like, no, I slept fine. Like, but again... We just bought it off Cheryl at Everett, and they bought it off someone else. I think uh, maybe Cheryl's parents who bought it off of someone else. Like, uh, I think, like, we figured out that the, the couches were probably constructed in the early 90s. Like, looking at the fabric of when was this, this popular? Because this is weird. It's very durable, though. I will say that for the fabric. It's very durable. But that's why they call this the poor tax, because... Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of studies done on this where buying the inexpensive, cheap shoes or uh, appliances or furniture for when you look over the lifespan of the item, you spend so much more in replacement than having bought the, the better made thing. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you have to have everything be, be a splurge item. Like I said, yard sales are great things. Estate sales are great things to stretch that money out because you can find things really inexpensively. We got, we, that's actually how we keep the restaurant in plates because people around here have no respect at all for, for tableware. Forks disappear, knives disappear, plates are shattered. All of plates just vanish. I don't know if people are putting them in their purse. I don't know what's going on with them. But we have pe people that go around to a lot of, flea markets and yard sales and stuff and we'll just buy stacks and stacks of plates because they're cheap mm -hmm. and we have a very eclectic bohemian look at the restaurant so it actually works having all the plates be kind of mis you know mismatched and everything yeah but even in our homewares you know we do a lot of that kind of thing as well because yeah there are things that you want to be precious about mm -hmm. i get that but when you're trying to make do with what money you have, like when we first moved in together, we had nothing like neither of our parents were going to give us anything for this house. Cause they did not understand why these two people were moving into a townhouse together with a third, third person. They had no, like, what, what is this? This makes no sense to us. Why not just stay home? Um, Cause nineties. So we furnished everything with a very few exceptions. We bought that, nightmare couch from a furniture store and i don't know what kind of space age polymers it was made out of but if somebody hadn't set it on fire we would probably still have it today that townhouse was a mess y'all you stuck in stories um, <laughs> but it, it lasted the entire time we were there until the incidents mm -hmm. happened and 
a couple other pieces of furniture, but everything else we bought very, very much from yard sales and everything. And we're able to fill out the house so that when we moved into the townhouse together, we had dishes, we had pots and pans to cook with. We had everything that we needed really cheap. We got our entire first set of dishes for what? $2? Something like that. Because they had a, they, there was just a box of plates and glasses. Mm -hmm. And it said $5 on it. And we just looked over and like, I'll give you two for the box. And they're like, are you taking it now? I'm like, yeah. Okay, fine. And I gave them $2. And we had all of the plates yep. and glasses that we were going to need. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we get a little, because of the consumerism that's baked into our econ economy, we get this very precious sense of, no, we're moving in together We for our first house together. Everything needs to be perfect and ideal. And what, like, we were just happy that we could afford a place that we liked that was nearby where our friends live. So all of us, a lot of our friends lived in walking distance and whatnot. To do that, we needed a roommate. So we, we had a roommate, which is also very interesting as a newly married couple to have a roommate. Um, just just putting that out there, be, be warned if that is your life experience. But you made it, we made it work, mm -hmm. you know? And that's really what, when we're talking about budgeting, that's what it is. It's finding those little places that you can, you know, cheat off the edges to make, to make it work and get what you need. But never, and I'm going to say this very, as somebody who has all of the health problems, don't scrimp on your shoes. Like we may have, you may be wondering why we're talking about shoes so much. Shoes are the most important piece of clothing shoes matter. that you own. Oh, oh, you want to tell another horror story we heard yesterday, Glory? Which one? That's shoes. Surgery. Oh. <sighs> okay, you tell it. Okay, so I, I want to say it was a friend. I don't think it was a relative of this. No, friend. it was a cousin. It was a cousin. cousin. Um, had, you know, has been working or, or was it maybe most, of her, her, most of her life, you know, at jobs where she has to stand. Like and, your stuff and, waitress and you know, so she figured, you know, and her feet hurt and she figured she had bone spurs. Yes, they are real. It's not just a joke line. We talk about other people. Um, but I mean, and bone spurs really do hurt in feet when they develop. Like that is, mm -hmm. that is a rough situation. It's a rough surgery. But, you know, they can fix it. You'll be fine in a few weeks. They go to examine her feet and they do some x-rays. She doesn't have any cartilage in her feet. She wore out all the cartilage on all oh. the joint in her feet. And your, and your foot is just like your hand. It's made up of a lot of tiny bones. bones. Yeah. yeah. With little, with just little cartilage between each of them, like There's little padding, none. like little pads. There, she wore it all out because she neglected her feet, and she only paid for cheap shoes, and she ignored her foot pain rather than, you know, it's called recovery shoes now these days. But essentially, you know, real soft, spongy shoes. So that to help your feet recover when you're not, you know, on your feet, when you're not working so much. So you wear, quote unquote, recovery shoes is what it's called. Yeah, she hadn't done that for like 30 years, 30 years old. And she doesn't have any foot cartilage. And so the doctors want to put pins in her feet in all the bones to connect them together since there's nothing else holding it together. And it's going to be surgeries. It's, they said, oh, well, you'll be off your feet for six weeks, like entirely off her feet. And this friend of Tom's is like, who's going to take care of you during? Oh, well, my husband, when he gets home. Yeah. What about when he's not home? Who's going to help you get to the bathroom? Who's going to help you get on the toilet? Who's uh, wheelchairs are expensive. Help. And and she said, "Look, I love you, but it's going I know you. It's going to be more than 6 weeks for your recovery." Cuz people who get pins in their bones do not recover that fast. Yeah, no. Let alone if it's your feet, you don't have a lot of circulation, so it's hard to get the nutrients it needs to repair. 
It's yep. slower to heal because there's so little circulation down there, especially if you're not on your feet, like six weeks of bed rest will do. So the only cheat you can do if you're going to go with cheaper shoes, you're still going to have to spend the money on insoles. Yeah, I was about to say That's insoles. Like, you need that shock absorption. You need the padding. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because I would, I would literally walk through the soles of a shoe in six months. Oh, yeah. Four, yeah, four, to, four to six months. Yeah. Every four to six months, I buy a new shoe. And that gets really expensive. So I would buy a cheaper shoe, a nice insole. The insole could go from one shoe to the other before it got mm. wore out. I could get two shoes out of one insole, one pair of insoles. So I could stretch a little bit further. But still, you got to have the padding. You have to have that, that extra support, especially if you're on your feet a lot. And that's where it that's helps, true. again, to do that small talk with other people. Mm -hmm. You don't know who has actually already done their research yep. on mm -hmm. what's the most cost effective shoes. And like, you know, one key phrase that Brian is very familiar with, if you need low cost shoes that last, that you, you know, if you're one of those people who walks, you know, through your shoes, means you literally type in and search food service shoes. Yep. Mm -hmm. They are yeah. literally made to be twice to three times as durable mm -hmm. because of the way you have to walk in food service. Yeah. And they don't cost much more than mm -hmm. the regular shoes. Now, are they pretty? No. No, they oh, are right there with nurses' shoes. But yeah. they will last mm -hmm. and they will save both your feet and a lot of money and heartache in the long run. Because mm -hmm. if you yeah, if you don't have good shoes, like that's going to affect your knees, that's going to affect your hips, your back. Mm -hmm. She has foot yeah. cartilage. She wore out all the cartilage in both her feet. That is crazy. And she's not even 40 years old. On the on yeah. that small talk note, oh darn, the, the sale went away. They, 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 they're called Hey Dude. They're, they're uh, yep. like an ugly brand of shoes, but they are ridiculously comfortable. Mm hmm. And then they, you know, you have to tie them. They're, they're just slip-ons. Yep. <laughs> but uh, they were on sale for a little while because somebody had mentioned that to me, and they're like, "Oh, you should check this out." It, it was, it was a little more than, than some of the other ones I was going through, and they're, they're much thicker sole. Actually, you don't need. And like, so. and like, that's also why you know YouTube is a wonderful thing. They're already on here. Yeah. Go check if you're interested in certain shoes. Just search them on YouTube and see if it, someone has done reviews of them. Mm -hmm. There's a few who even do literal destructive reviews where they will cut them in half and really mm -hmm. see what is the quality of craftsmanship. Will this really last as well as, you know, doing their regular test on it to know, like, are you going to go through these shoes in yeah. four to six months or will they last you a decade? Mm -hmm. And it's worth it to save up and spend twice as much on a shoe that you'll have in a decade. It's also better to sp make sure you're getting shoes that aren't going to require you to have future medical bills. Yeah. Like, look, I, I I loved high heels back in the day when I could still wear them, but they are not the best for your health, to say it lightly. Especially the the higher the heel, the closer to heel, the cl closer to Jesus, because you're going to die. Like you are doing damage to your body. Also, a lot of people don't realize that um, with heels. The difference between comfortably wearing heels all day and uh, being miserable in a form of destruction you willingly put on your feet is actually where is the center of the heel attached. So what I mean by that, well, let me look up. So there, is, uh, I'm going to show you what you're actually looking for. And yes, they do, in fact, charge more for this. So if your heel is directly in the ball of your foot, like it's ready to just stab you through, you know, your foot, that will break your foot. Uh, are those bat batons? Okay. So do you see here? This is where the center is. It's actually in the middle of the heel of the foot. Um, versus... This, if you look, it actually goes closer to the end. You want it 
as close to the outer edge of the foot as humanly possible. Like, do you see how this is where the heel is? Uh, the classic writing. That is heel. the difference between you, if you, when it's like this, where that heel is moved all the way out to the edge of your foot, that you can wear all day much more comfortable because you're, you're standing and you're walking in a solid formation. So your foot is actually receiving that support versus this, this will destroy you. Because you see what's happening is the physics, all that energy is going more to up here versus at the edge. Where it can, where it can distribute out. And you're destroying your foot and ankle and your calves, your shins as well, because the heel is moved in closer to the arch. Yeah, the further back you can. So this is this, even though this looks insane. But this, you can actually wear this all day. And that is the difference between quality heels and misogynist heels. Those red ones? Yep. Those will kill you. Oh, yeah. Those They'll will break you. your foot, break your ankle. Destroy your feet. Versus that black one right below. That uh -huh. looks ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous stiletto. But again, Louis Vuitton. That yep. you will actually be able to wear all day. Wear all day. And while it may you may your foot may be a little tired, you also know it's a Louis Vuitton, so there's a steel shank in that mm -hmm. center supporting your foot. Mm -hmm. Your foot will actually last better in that ridiculous stiletto. Then that well, oh again, that kitten heel will you kill see you. See this? Oh. This is too close to the arch. You want it all the way at the very back. And that goes for other kinds of shoes, not just heels. When you are looking at shoes, really look at them. Really look at them. And make sure that you're getting that support all the way out at the edge. That you will be able to wear all day, every day, and your feet won't swell. You'd be surprised Versus how much an inch... Mm -hmm. Makes half a difference in shoes. That's half what the, the shoe repair guy told me. Half an inch. And yes, by the way, uh, and no, I am not sponsored by the shoe repair industry, but you can take the vast majority of heels and most other shoes to the shoe repair shop and say, hey, can you change out the heel so that it's all the way out? And they will. They may have to special order the heel to get the right one to fit that shoe, but they can do that and match color and everything for minimal money. So you can take the equivalent of a cheap shoe or at least a mid-range shoe and turn it into an ultra luxury quality by just getting a different heel installed. Because this really is one of those places where, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a mm -hmm. pound of cure. Yes. And this is something that my great grandmother always used to just pound into our heads is, Anything that you can do to keep yourself from getting hurt or sick, that is where you should be putting all as much of your energy as you can because it's so much easier to not to do things to prevent preventable harm than mm -hmm. to deal with the cost incurred. Like, it's why I jokingly always say, you know, don't run upstairs. It's the cheapest thing you can do. Just walk up the dang stairs. Okay? I have lived a life of pain. Because I was too dumb to walk up a flight of stairs. I ran up a flight of stairs and forever shall it haunt my destiny. You know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. it's the, the, whatever, whatever you can do. Because this is where the budgets get hit the hardest mm -hmm. is with preventable. Because there's nothing you can do for unexpected medical things. Like, mm -hmm. you never know when some little thing is going to become a big thing. Like, some things are just unprovoked, you know, just out of nowhere. But a lot of a lot of what really will keep you in good stead is making sure that you're not hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. Also, learning to play the warranty game. Like I know a lot of people that swear off warranties. Warranties are a lot. Oh no! If you know that you are hard on something, and you can find a company that has a glorious warranty that lets you do things again, like. There, there are companies that despise us because 
we not only print out the warranty, we exercise it. We, when we were having some problems with the hard water at the, at the restaurant, we went through, I think, five really nice industrial coffee makers and did not have to pay for a single one of them because hard water damage was covered under the warranty. Yes. So we just called them up and got a new, <laughs> a new one sent to us. And they'd sent a, pack, a paid package to send the old one back. Yes, a lot of warranties are scams. So you have to read them very carefully. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are like, give us money and we will do absolutely nothing, but thank you for the money. Mm -hmm. But there are ones out there. I know Best Buy hated me <laughs> because I had read their warranty policy back backwards inside and out. And I know I'm a klutz. So any delicate machinery that I have to get my hands on will get damaged. And if I can get access to a warranty that covers the said damage. So, yeah, warranties. Oh, my goodness. If you are getting something, think of it in terms of how comfortable are, is your budget and you going to be replacing this in less than the warranty time period. Because sometimes, yeah, that, that 25 30 bucks you're going to want to keep, spend. And if you're careful enough with whatever you're buying, and you know you're you're going, to, it's going to last the years or four years you're going to get for the warranty. Save the 25 30 bucks. But if you need that thing to work for the next four years and to not have to replace it in the next four years, just get the warranty because at least then you have the peace of mind. You won't have to buy to replace it in four years. Oh, he is the and, king of warranties. And like, don't forget the secret to successfully getting warranties is as Charlie said, print them out, but then if you, in some form or another, literally attach the printed warranty document to the device. So like just literally get a, um, a eight by 12, an eight by 12, um, uh, envelope, put the warranty in there and tape it to the washing machine. And summon your best Bev Goldberg, and do not take no for an answer. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. so much equipment just through careless mishandling broken, and I only had to buy it once because you know a year and a half later they would break it. So after whatever the manufacturer warranty coverage was, they would break it after that period. But because I got the four year warranty, it was like okay, I only buy this once, and. You know, and of course, some of the warranties, you know, look at the percentage amount you're paying for the for that guarantee as well. Because if you're paying, you know, 30, 40 percent of the value of the product, it's not worth getting that guarantee. Because at that yeah, point, no. you're better off just saving that money and matching the other 30 or 40 percent because you're not going to get the warranty money back. But I couldn't tell you how many times I put that little extra 10 percent in for that four year guarantee and got a new product before that four years was up. <laughs> Brian versus, is the king of warranties. Versus, uh, and I'll, I'll talk, it's time for another break. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I literally have almost 20 warranties outstanding right now that on yeah. products that. <laughs> I think I would just also say on the subject, read through the manual. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might be surprised the little things, the little gems of information in the manual. Oh, yeah. Um, and it could be the most mundane manuals. And it was like, oh, did you know that it also does this? That's not even on any of the box, any of the advertising info. It doesn't even say it does that. Oh, my God, it does. Th read the manual at least once through. You don't have to read it all in one sitting like a novel. But go ahead and read through it one time. You know, it could be a month or so after you started using the equipment. But read through it once because you might be surprised, pleasantly surprised, at the hidden gems in there or the information, the secret stuff that is not publicized. And on that note.
We're going to do a little breaky break. And we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. <music>
Me, 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 You'd have to unmute, Tom. We were discussing the glory of slow slow cookers. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I was just looking at the smoker to figure out how to adjust it so um, it will smoke more. Mm -hmm. Hello, Jenna, the soul writer. So the other part, though, I want to talk about warranties is um, the... I don't know what you call it, but sort of in the same vein, um, insurance of at least to me, one thing, at least Americans are going to come across a lot when it comes to insurance, that is, do you need it or not questions, um, is phone insurance and the way you figure out of like, is it, is, you know, you need to actually look though at what does the insurance cover? Mm -hmm. because sometimes it is whatever the depreciated value is like it what it covers goes down every month mm -hmm. so it's one of those it it's another where it pays to read mm -hmm. but like i usually keep the insurance on there for a year to 18 months because at that point yeah it'll be more way more expensive to replace it than to just repair mm-hmm um, but after two years, I'm already looking at getting another phone. Why would I really care that much about keeping the insurance on my old phone? But I know plenty of people who, again, just forget about it. Mm -hmm. And this is where we live in modern times. And most of us keep our own little government tracking device called a phone on us at all times. Let's use it for everything it's worth if it's going to take away some of our freedoms. Mm -hmm. You can put alarms years, months any time far away you need. So when you get it, you can actually set an alarm for check your insurance on the phone. It's time to remove it. And then because we're all ADHD here, you set it for the next two weeks of, you know, have it go off every few days of have you mm -hmm. checked. Mm -hmm. So at some point you will go check and see like, you know, do you still have it on there? Do you still want it on there? Yeah. Of, um, and you know, for me at least, there's another thing to spend some, you know, to save up and spend a little bit of extra money on when you can, or look for when there is a sale. So like with our is like with phones because we use it so much, it is a portable computer, and how much it does can affect how well we use it. Um, the phones we got, we got uh, two years ago now, maybe mm -hmm. three years ago now. I think it's closer to three years ago because it was. Just a few months after I got back from the hospital. And we got it on a sale. Like it didn't actually say it was on a sale, but it was surprisingly low cost for what it could do. Mm -hmm. And so I got it then. Like I made, you know, a deal and I, I got us both and I kept the insurance on there for two years mm -hmm. and we definitely used it. Um, and it has kept us in good stead, but these phones have actually lasted and they are fast enough. They have enough processing and memory that we don't have a lot of issues with them mm -hmm. versus the previous ones that were also lower to mid end would give us periodic problems. And that's why we would always be upgrading as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it is sometimes worth it to spend that extra money or like actually as we do now, as I said, we've had it close to three years now, and part of that's because I've looked and I haven't seen any good deals for any replacements, so it's not worth it to replace them. Mm -hmm. Even to get the phones now would literally cost twice as much as what I bought them for three years ago. Mm -hmm. Also, this is where it's really important when you're buying technology to be thinking about what you are going to be using it for and then what lifespan you want on it. This is why like all the laptops I get are MacBook Pros because... I only replaced my last MacBook. We had it for, what, 12 years? Yeah. And the only reason I replaced it was it would cost far more for because of its age and the fact that the kind of RAM that it had in it really isn't on the market anymore because 12-year-old laptop. <laughs> um, yeah. 
like the special order just to upgrade ram plus it just uh would have been a nightmare and mm -hmm. you know, it was starting to show its age like none of the keys on the keyboard had letters on them anymore because use mm -hmm. like but i i know what i'm using this for i know i'm going to be compressing audio with it i'm going to be doing video with it i'm going to be rendering Im uh, cgi images with it so i know i need a processor that's going to be able to last a good long time with a lot of hard work on it and that's the answer that i found for me was to save up and get a machine that i don't have to replace we were before we got the first macbook we were replacing mm -hmm. computers every like two three years because literally we were burning the chips out yeah because of all yeah. of the uh, the like processing audio and video taxes <laughs> the machine hard and that was the other part of the math so if you're you might be able to get a pc for four or five hundred bucks <laughs> if, if you're lucky you do a lot of shopping around and if it's only gonna last you three, four years, you're still spending a hundred, hundred and twenty-five a year versus a thousand dollar MacBook, you know, that lasts twelve years, it's less than a hundred dollars a year. You know, so when you're buying it, you wanna actually go, okay, how many years do I expect to get out of this? Or can I expect to get out of this reasonably? And figure out the cost over those years. And it's one nice way to compare because just because once again it's it's back to buying that cheap cheap furniture that's gonna break. If it's cheap furniture and you only need it for a year and you're gonna you know it's 20 bucks okay fine you only need it for a year you're gonna replace it okay but if you need it to last 10 years something that might be a thousand dollars the last 10 and you're years gonna be over working it and abusing yeah. it yeah. yeah working and abusing it because <clears throat> those know. are things that you really need to take into effect like if you're just typing in google docs and that's all that you do really yeah, Chromebook is fine. Get get yourself an inexpensive Chromebook. It'll probably do you well. But don't be surprised if it doesn't have some of the other capabilities that you're looking for. Now, some of the nice things is with cloud computing finally actually maturing, uh, like a lot of my audio processing actually takes place off, off system now because both of the apps that I use, both Soundtrap and Descript, will let you upload to the cloud server and have the cloud server actually do the rendering for audio and video. And then you just download the result, which one takes a lot less time, but also is putting less wear and tear on my machine. And so those are things to be thinking about when you're looking at the lifespan of what you're doing, because if you're doing a lot of video, that $300 laptop, uh, <laughs> is not going to be worth it because you're going to take so much extra time yeah and the same thing for cars the same yeah. you know yeah. how so one thing people really don't talk about when they talk about cars and getting a vehicle to use is how much maintenance and how much are the parts to replace on it mm -hmm. i have i've had um two almost identical, like they were two years apart in manufacturing uh, lower end cars. One was a Ford and one was a Mazda. That Ford literally cost half as much for all the parts to replace on it mm -hmm. that the Mazda took. And the Mazda was hard to even find the parts on and to find a mechanic who could even work on the Mazda. Mm -hmm. And so and we cars. talked and we talked with a friend of ours, you know, yesterday, you know, that um, her, she is, she, her cousin didn't really know much about cars. And her father, for one of her first cars, bought her a, a Dodge sports car. And sports cars, while they do have more power in them, do require a lot more upkeep. Like you have to check all the fluids a minimum. Every time you fill up the tank. Yeah, you really do need to check it every time you fill the tank because if anything goes out of balance in a sports car, it shows real fast. Things break down fast because it is working on the edge of what it's capable of. Mm -hmm. Versus if you are a beginner, if you are just not someone who really wants to fuss with cars, if you are, if the idea of getting grease and oil on your hands is, eh, then sports car is not for you. You need to get a car that requires minimal maintenance 
that is, you know, essentially a tank. It may, you know, and just accept it may not be the prettiest because if you're not willing to put in the time, you're not going to be able to keep it pretty anyway. And also be very careful with certain models of cars. It keeps changing because they keep getting called out for it, but it's a practice that's not going to go away. They are tr a lot of the uh, car manufacturers are wanting to make it illegal for you to repair your own car. Yeah, we were talking about oh. that yesterday. The right and, to repair law in Massachusetts. Yep. And that the Federal Department of Transportation is on the side of the manufacturers, not on the side of their oh, own yeah. citizens to repair that. Mm, I got so many issues. They've always been. That's why we didn't have electric cars. Yeah, they've always been years. on the side of the manufacturers. But this is becoming a really big problem. My, my brother runs a trucking company, and it's getting really hard to find a you know 18 wheeler that because it's not just a it's technically a violation of the owner's agreement to do work on the car they're finding replacement parts is virtually impossible because they've patented all the parts in it mm -hmm. so finding the replacement parts even if you did have the know-how and weren't afraid that you were going to get caught repairing your own car which like this entire statement is so dystopian like, we know a farmer in the area who's currently having legal troubles because he fixed his John Deere tractor. Mm. And that is a violation of the ownership agreement. You're not allowed to fix it yourself. You got to pay them for it. So when you are looking for a vehicle, and they keep trying to do this in uh, consumer-grade cars. That's one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up is a couple companies have tried slipping this into the... Uh, Sale agree sales agreement. This is also very prevalent when you sign a lease agreement. Uh, a friend of ours was looking at leasing a car for re reasons we talked her out of it, but the lease agreement she agreed that any maintenance had to be done through them. And if it was found that repairs were done through somebody else, she basically owed them the cost of repair. Yep, mm -hmm. so even if she took it somewhere else to get repairs. When she brought took, took it back in to trade it in and they saw, oh, those aren't our tires mm -hmm. or what have you, they could charge her for the co cost of those things. So be very careful in the way they're trying to nickel and dime the just to take all the money <laughs> for themselves. Mm -hmm. It just feels so like Blade Runner future to be talking about, like, make sure you have the right to repair your own car. But... That's where we are now. Yeah. And again, this is where having friends who are into something really comes in handy of, um, I have to go, I have to go ask my friend again, her husband, you know, brought up this website where everyone keeps the list of like all the cars, you know, how long does a car last and how, what are the common repairs on it? So you can look up all the cars before you get something to see, is this a car that is worth the time and effort? Because like, I mean, I still remember in the 2000s, if you got a used Ford car, by the time it reached 200,000 miles, you were going to have to replace all the rubber on it. All the hoses, all the belts, that's what would go out on it. Versus if it was a Chevy, all the electrical was going to have to be replaced by 200,000 miles. Of it just helps to know what kind of maintenance they need. I mean, mm -hmm. thankfully, a lot of cars are lasting longer now, but it helps if you know someone who that's what their interest is and can kind of help you guide what's a good one to get and mm -hmm. match you with the right one. And that's something we were we did when we were buying our car. What was that like nine years ago? Seven, seven, a while back. He's playing the difference. We're at eight years now. In the um, before time. It's okay. There's nobody's going to check your work, Brian. Somewhere in the before time. Because when we were looking around, because we needed a, a car that could do a lot of travel, because I did not, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm completely over my flight I'm issues. A go -getter. I, no, I, I don't like to fly. And even though I did enjoy the time in the planes this time around that's not a guarantee that i will not have a panic attack next time i'm in a airport so yeah. anytime we tra travel we generally do so by car so it had to be able to you know handle all, 
you know, from here to Maryland and back, because that's the most common long form trip that we take. And at the time, uh, the Toyotas had some of the best ratings on them for maintenance costs and what whatnot back when we when we bought one, and which is why we focused in on that. And our little car has well, <laughs> better than any of the other cars that we've had, but we did a lot of research into it. And the only reason we ended up getting the model that we currently have is my knees weren't in the dashboard. But, you know, there was a lot of free research that went into what companies are we not, what lots are we not even going to darken the doorstep of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it just would not be worth it to go in. And at the time, that was very much Ford. Mm -hmm. Ford was known for, it had a lot of overheating issues at the time. Mm -hmm. So Ford's you know, always overheat. May I never be stuck in stop and go traffic in a Ford vehicle. And also, as I learned from a friend of mine, never get any kind of um, lease or especially a loan agreement with, um, oh, what's their names? Um, of course, I've now forgotten. You almost made me call out there from one of our local dealerships. You'd have to give us a single hint, Tom, for us to even help you. Uh, it's an Asian car. Uh, i try to remember which one it is. Like, it's not Kia or Hyundai. Oh. Um, it's not Subaru. For some reason, I keep wanting to say Miata. Um, well, you know Subarus have to have kind of decent things, or the lesbians would have come for them. Daewoo. Yeah. Um, but it's what it's it's got a I swear I think it's got a symbol similar to Subaru like it may be stars or something. But hear Subaru is one of the main manufacturers against Massachusetts right to repair law. Yep. And I'm like, have the lesbians found out about this yet? Because no they fury work on their own cars. Just saying. Hell hath no fury like a lesbian scorn. Um, but anyway, it was because he did for a few years, um, you know, when you go get the car back from a broken loan. Repossess. Oh, okay. Repossess. And it was mostly for this one manufacturer because of the way they did their um, oh, their loan agreements. Sure it wasn't Jan. Um, look at Mitsubishi. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Mitsubishi had the most sleazy loan agreements. And he had to repossess so many because of the way it was designed. That you know, they almost all had balloon payments at the end of them. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, no, just stay away from Mitsubishi. Like if they if this is what the kind of stuff they want to pull, then they are not even worth dealing with. Of uh, it's good to know which manufacturers and like while Toyota, you know, top brass are awful people like so many. Oh, yeah. I, I have to agree with Charlie of, but the vehicles do last, especially the um, the regular consumer grade uh, transport cars. They are made to last. And they they are designed, the parts are easy and simple to replace, too. And they did take care of us because we got... Yeah, yeah, and the warranty. <laughs> the, the guy didn't understand because I didn't haggle too much over the price, but I read the warranty end to end, negotiate main negotiations in it, made sure some adjustments were printed from the corporate paperwork, you know, that it was all filed and proper. And yeah, I've got a bumper to, like because it's a hybrid. I was very concerned about the electrical mm. going wonky over time because that can be very expensive. Yeah. Bumper to bumper, full electrical lifetime of the car as long as I keep up with the maintenance cycle. And that'll actually transfer. If I were to do a personal sell to somebody, that mm -hmm. warranty will transfer. It's added value to the car um, in its transfer. And I had it all printed because <laughs> it's in writing and signed, and of course. But this way, then I also had that peace of mind because that's the other thing with warranties and insurances. I would rather pay an extra grand at close to know that for the lifetime of the car, as long as I keep with the maintenance schedule, I don't have to worry about the electrical going bad. And if it does, I take it to the dealership and they fix it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Completely. 
and and so that I have that peace of mind now. And we've saved so much money over time having that hybrid because the short jaunts in and out of town. Oh yeah, yeah. Because a lot of the a lot of the trip in and out is up and down the the hills. So it's just charging the battery, using the battery, charging the battery, using the battery, charging the battery, using the battery. And that's something else to think about because I know people look at the price of like hybrid vehicles and they're like, but they cost more. There's also a lot of gas savings depending on how you do the driving and the terrain that you're in. That you're in. It's very hilly around here. So every time you go downhill, you're charging the battery. And especially if you have a plug-in hybrid mm -hmm. where you can just plug it in. If you can plug in, you know, when you st stay home at night, then if you're not driving more than 50 miles, you haven't even actually used gas and the electrical will be cheaper mm -hmm. yeah. to run at. Of Like, again, you're not actually even using the engine as much as you would in a normal car. So the engine will last longer. There's a conversion adapter for our car if we, I forgot, it's like 150, I think, for them to install it. But if the power goes out, we could actually use our car as a generator mm -hmm. for the house. We didn't have the extra money at the time that we got the car, so we didn't have that installed. But it's, a, it's an aftermarket thing that you can have installed at any time. And that's, uh, is this where we should, should bring up multitaskers as far as budgeting is concerned? Fine. Like it's not just for good eats rants. Mm -hmm. Multitaskers are so important. Finding those things that you can use for so many different tasks that, that, that you're doing in, in your life. Like one of the reasons we splurged on the Zeroji is there's a lot of steamed food that I love. And I also love rice. And we go through rice cookers really fast because most of like the cheap $15 rice cookers they last if you make rice every once in a while if you're like making rice daily or several times a week oh they're not going to last long those springs those heated springs that they use for thermal regulation are going to melt they're not going to they're not going to make it they're going to wear out charlie yes do you know what the Jerushi rice cookers do an amazing job making aside from rice? Yeah, what? Oatmeal. Oh, Holy yes. cow. Oh, yeah. oh, God, yes. Nobody talks about it. Why is everybody sleeping on this? But yeah, like getting the right cooking tools of like, get, you know, and it's also why we love electric pressure cookers. That's why um, we love the bread machine because. Y'all, there is so much going wrong in the planetary, the Earth's food supply. Yep. And that includes bread and dairy. The things that used to be pure are not anymore. And I hate to use the pure word because fascists yep. abuse this word a lot. <sighs> I try not to be fascist. Seriously, every time I hear an Italian talk about pasta, I just fascist and fascist. But really, well, like, we don't even want to acknowledge that they didn't invent pasta anyway. But paying attention to the equipment you can purchase and put in your own home that actually will help you eat better. So do you know how many people tell me, oh, Glory, a bread machine is such a frivolous appliance? It's not if you eat bread. It's not if you want to make cake in it. They now can make jam in it. Same with the electric pressure cookers. Good Lord, I love an electric pressure cooker. It is everything the stovetop pressure cooker is not. Yes. So wonderful. It is so ADHD friendly, just like slow cookers. And now, you know, the electric pressure cooker can also do slow cooking. Yep. So you're saving counter space, which is wonderful. But again, that ADHD mind, which if you have still, if you are here in the third hour and you are still listening to us, did you know that you have ADHD or a loved one that you care very much for has ADHD? Because you are used to listening to people with ADHD go on like us. 
So if you are ADHD, then that electric pressure cooker, you can cook anything slow, fast. You forgot to put it in the slow cooker before you went to work. That's okay. The electric pressure cooker's got you covered. It'll have that done in an hour or less. It's like magic. And you don't even have to babysit it. It'll do it all by itself. You can go take a shower. You can go clean. You can go watch TV. You don't have to keep track. Because even when it's done, it'll then just keep it warm. You don't have to worry about it. It's Here's how you forget it. With the bread maker, though. If you're, say you're only going through one loaf of bread a week, which a lot of these households are going through, probably a lot more. But one loaf of bread a week, $3 a loaf, say they're getting some cheaper bread. That's $150 by the end of the year. That's each year. That's each a bread year. machine. Right. And you can make bread and freeze it if you want. You can also make other things, not just plain bread. But you can set, most bread machines now come with an ability to set it for hours so you can have fresh bread when you want it. Like first thing in the morning when you get up or when you get home from work, the bread is done and it's still hot and fresh so that you can have fresh bread with dinner. I mean, that is a luxury normally only the rich get. You can have that because now you have all these machines as servants. And quite frankly, they really are so much more affordable than paying people. But it's wonderful. They're reliable. It is fantastic. And again, you know what's going in your food. And I know growing up, I used to hear that and think, what is up with adults? Like, is it really a problem? People like eating so much strange stuff. And my mother's like, oh, they used to before the the um, the food laws. That my mother was born in 1946. By the way, Everett brings up the speaking of teenage boys. Speaking of, if you have a child in your house, one day they will become a teenager and they will inhale bread. They will just like the cone heads, but your child will not have a cone for a head. It'll just be an adolescent, boys and my, girls both. I remember like the moment my grandmother realized I was a teenager, I would go over to the house and she would just put a whole loaf of bread and several sticks of butter onto the table with a knife and a plate and yep. would be like, just have fun. Just have fun. I, I, I will be in the other room. Let me know when you're done or if you need something else. Just <laughs> I, I just don't need to witness what yes. you're about to do. I I wish we'd had it a bread machine growing up. Uh, I was making bread by hand back then as a teenager. I started making it in middle school. And like I'd be in the kitchen Saturdays. If I wasn't babysitting, then my mother would wake me up at 11 a.m. You got to get the bread started. And I mean, like, li literally my mother and sister's job, if I was making bread, because my mother would freeze any bread afterwards that we didn't eat, like, within two days, uh, so that she could just bring it out anytime my siblings were hungry. This was right before adolescence hit them. My mother and sister's job was to go through all the lower cabinets and find all the baking pans. So we could start, because I, I would have to make the bread in batches. And we would just make bread. I would make dough and knead the dough until we ran out of flour. That was my job. And I mean, like, and I used to, I was like, Mom, why do you always wait? And she's like, I was like, why, why are you always like pressuring me to make bread on Saturdays? And she said, you're a nicer person when you make bread. <laughs> And I thought it was because of the kneading, because I thought you were supposed to abuse bread dough to get it good, which you are. I hate, oh, do you know how like ragey I get when I watch YouTube videos and everybody's being all sweet and gentle with their dough? Oh, and I'm like, why are you treating it like that? You're not, that is not how you get good bread. That is how you get wimpy bread. You have to toughen up your dough. But anyway. And I thought it was for that. But years later, I asked my mother again, what was up with your obsession? This was after I got the bread machine and she'd come over because she loved all my bread experiments. And she'd take over, she'd take home any half loaf, you know, any leftover loaf um, uh, for my bread experiments. And I was like, why were you always so obsessed with my bread? And she said, because you were always a happier person. 
And I was like, you mean because I was beating dough? She said, no, I think it was, she said, I think it was because you actually were getting enough food. <laughs> that, that's why your sister and I would get you up and support you to make all of this dough and help you. Because like literally what would happen is I would take care of the whole dough kneading rising process. And once it was ready to bake, mom was in charge because my ADHD just not there. So mom and my sister would use a timer and they would keep track and they would just bake for about three hours. They'd be baking bread, doing it in stages. Um, and she's like, no, I, I used to get you up because you could actually make the bread. She's like, you saw me. I tried so many times. I did not have the gift. So I assume you got it from your father's side. Um, but you were just happier. Yes, probably from beating dough, but also from just being fed and eating it. And I could tell that your skin cleared up when you ate your bread rather than the commercial bread I was buying. It really made me start investigating all the ingredients, even in the whole uh, grain bread that my mother would buy. She said, your acne went away when you were eating your homemade bread versus the commercial bread I was buying. And I realized if it's not good for my eldest, it's not good for the other ones either. Because whatever is causing your acne to be so bad that, and it's clearing up when you eat your own homemade bread, then it's probably going to, it's affecting the other kids too. And that's also why. So your sister and I agreed. And so your sister was the one who used to wake me up to go wake you up because she was afraid of me. Understandably. Fair. Yes. I was a bear when I would be woken up when I was in middle school and high school. I was a bear to wake up. I was not happy to be woken up. And she'd go wake up my mother to go wake me up. So it's bread baking day. Go get glory. It's bread baking day. Uh, and my mother would, she used to freeze commercial bread. So instead she'd freeze all my loaves and they would like mom would anytime the bread was on the, uh, not the bread, the flour was on sale. She'd buy extra and she'd store it in the back of the cabinet with the baking pans so that whenever it was bread making day, we would have so much flour that I could make all the kinds, you know, the honey wheat, the country white, the cheddar chive bread, you name it. I'd take orders for my mom and sister and my father. <laughs> A total bear. Brrr. Uh, yes, Everett has seen me in the morning. I am not in my best. But, like, it really, uh, y'all, I grew up and I, at my entire adolescence, I only had two pimples at any given time. One, well, two times in my entire adolescence, I had three pimples on my face at once. And I thought it was the end of the world. And the reason I had so few pimples, according to my mother, was because I was primarily eating homemade bread because she noticed anytime I ate commercial bread, I'd break out. So she knew something was in the bread that was causing my skin, my acne to flare up. And there may be something to it. I want you all to be healthy. So again, something to think about. And you know, the thing is, you'll find these appliances at yard sales, at thrift stores, at salvage stores. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. I mean, I would still recommend plug it in. Make sure it lights up. Check the cord for any damage, like little, little micey chewing, nibbling on it. Don't, don't get the stuff that, you know, has questionable electricals in it. But as long as it looks fine, you don't see any wear and tear in the cording, and it plugs in and it works, get these appliances. They will help you. It's like, do you realize how much time people spend washing dishes? It is worthwhile to get a dishwasher so that you can instead use that time for whatever you want to spend your time with. Again, when they talk about time is money, time can be also happiness. It can be fulfillment. It can be enjoyment. Having a dishwasher can be the difference between scrubbing dishes every day and taking a walk with your family or writing that novel an hour a day at a time. It is that difference. You let appliances, let these machines help you live the life you want, even though, yes, we do live in a dystopia, you can still eke out some happiness. And bread was one of our luxury foods during the dark times at the end of our mm -hmm. time in California, because 
we had a bread bread machine. It was, and flour, salt, and yeast are inexpensive. Uh -huh. So it's like so rock bottom prices still. Y'all, you can have amazing bread with just all purpose flour, some yeast, and a little bit of salt and yeah. water. You would you would be <laughs> surprised the quality you could get for next to zero dollars. And that's where a lot of this comes in is by learning how to use some of these convenience devices, be they the slow, the slow cookers or the pressure cookers or the bread machines. We, we have switched over to fast food, which is a lot more expensive, pre-made meals, which is a lot more expensive. And, and it's a lot of, it's questionable. There's a lot of yeah, questionable ingredients. Very questionable. And the nutritional value is very little, little. But just learning how to use some of these really simple tools that you can get into your get into your house, like just if nothing else, get a slow cooker. Soups are the easiest things to make, mm -hmm. and they're so healthy for you. And a little bit of ingredients can go a long way. The cheapest, nastiest, gnarliest cuts of meat that you would never like feed a dog because they would be chewing on them forever. Put them in a slow cooker. Let them go all day in a knife. Just, just with water, you can add other spices and seasonings too. Mm -hmm. But just with water, it's going to make such a lovely broth, and so the meat yeah. is going to get so tender and amazing that you're going to be like, "What? What is this garbage meat that you're giving me?" That's actually honestly like whatever the cheapest meat you can find at the store, the clearance meat in the slow cooker, plus whatever is the cheapest sauce that you can stand to eat. Whether we're talking barbecue sauce, ketchup. Your favorite Pop salad sauce. dressing. That yeah. is the 1970s crock pot, right? It's yeah. a roast and a whole bottle of Catalina or Russia dressing or Thousand Island, because this was before Ranch had made it into the national market. Don't forget Italian. Just Italian. And you just literally, that's it. It's just meat and salad dressing, and you leave it for eight hours on low. Now, I'm going to say this. Personally, I will get acid. I will get acid reflux. I'll get indigestion if I don't sear the meat first, because of more than likely some, you know, otherwise innocent bacteria just sitting on the surface of the meat. But I, I'm in the minority of that. Like I think at least three quarters of humans don't experience that problem, but I do. So I would say, sear the meat. You just on each side. But nevertheless, you can still do it in the pressure cooker as well. Yeah. It's just salad dressing and meat. Could be chicken, could be anything on this planet. Whatever's the cheapest dang thing. Whatever, I don't know. Is there any meat on that? Or is it just weird pieces of bone they've cut for some bizarre reason? Some mismatch. Do you remember mis miscut meat? Do you remember yeah. that? Back when they actually were cutting, they were butchering it at the grocery store. And it's like, oh, it's the new guy's month. And so it's all miscut chicken and miscut pork and miscut beef. You know, the, worst the, only thing, huh? the worst thing that happened to us poor poor folk is when rich people found out that oxtails are delicious. Yes. Because they used to be so cheap because nobody wanted the tail. Nobody yep. wanted the tail. And there's so mm -hmm. much good meat and flavor in in there. You just put it in the in this in the crock pot and just let it go all day to get all tender and release all that flavor. And oh my god, it was so good. It's such an easy meal. But yeah, it's it's a wonderful or, cheap way to cook. Or if you have, or if you know, or during you know this um, holiday seasons, if you get a ham, mm -hmm. when you slice after you slice the meat off, if you get a bone in ham after you slice the meat off, mm -hmm. take that bone, put it in the crock pot, and put some beans in there and some water, mm -hmm. and just let it go for a day. Oh my God, the house will smell like heaven. And after that, you clean the bone off a little bit and you put it in another pan with some water and some greens. Mm -hmm. There's enough flavor left in that bone to make those yep. greens so good. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And again, you're getting off all that cartilage and that is going to help you health-wise. And that's three meals from one mm -hmm. cut of, from one thing of meat. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking like big meals too, not like little yeah. like portions of me meals. Like that's three big things. But again, that's and that is part of budget. That's what this is all part of budgeting. Yeah. 
budgeting is not just about, as I said, it's not the monthly bills. It is about all the expenses. It's about being your smart life. with your money instead of frivolous. To be smart with your money is to shop the sales, the real sales. One of the things I learned, so there is a grocery store in our town. It's a regional grocery store. And one of the things they are kind of known for is their buy one, get one free. They have buy one, get one free on everything and not all at once, obviously. But every week, some of their food is buy one, get one free. And what I learned is their prices are when it's buy one, get one free and you, you know, average it out for the two things you got for the price of one. And their meat is also buy one, get one. They'll do pretty much everything but the beer section. They'll do buy one, get one free. And what I figured out was when it is buy one, get one free, that is the cheapest you will see that product in this entire town for the whole year. So whatever is buy one, get one free, I will look and see, do we eat that? And if we eat that, then that is a good deal. Buy that. So I then don't have to worry about, oh, but is this a good price? It's buy one, get one free which means it's the lowest cost. And maybe once or once a year or every other year, I will check the prices again. Just is this still, it is still 20 years. This has been going on for sure. And it is always the cheapest price. I will ever see this product in this town. How have we gone this long talking about bu budgets and stretching your money and not brought up the phrase deep freeze? Well, we talked about it last <laughs> time. I know, but still, it needs to be like, said. Again. I am very <laughs> proud to say that several people who are regulars, uh, like who come to this show regularly, have purchased or are literally saving up to purchase deep freezes because of our continued conversations about your pantry. Part of your pantry is your deep freeze. It is absolutely worth it to invest in a deep freeze. And yes, you can get deep freezes as small as a cubic foot. Mm -hmm. And they are shockingly affordable. Like it's not like it used to be 25 years ago when I was looking for a tiny deep freeze. And like the little one to two square cubic foot was like $300. It's now $85, y'all, for a cubic one to two cubic feet. Uh, deep freezes. Yes, you have to look around to find a seller for it, but it's there. The larger ones that will fit in any apartment, except maybe those tiny New York closets, but it will fit in any standard studio apartment. You know, those little baby guys? That are mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Those are like, uh, I think, $150 US. And again, you can shop those meat sales and freeze it. So we know exactly which places that we like to get meat from. And you, this will vary wherever you are. So you need to look around. Yeah, you have to do this. But like a day before a lot of meat hits its sell-by, there's a couple places around here that will put it on like really high sale because they would want to sell it instead of write it off because they get more mm -hmm. money selling it at a discount than they will if they have to write it off. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, it's still good meat. You just mm -hmm. buy it in bulk and put it in the freezer. And that's how we would keep things like lamb and some of the other more expensive meats in the house because mm -hmm. every about at the end of every month, every two months, they're like, well, I guess nobody bought the whole of the lamb. Let's put it on sale. Yay! <laughs> and then you just go and you get it all, and it's just sitting in the deep freeze for when mm -hmm. you want for when you want to have it. And you can just throw it in the pressure cooker. But again, like, it's about being smarter with your money rather than being frivolous. I like that word frugal because it's really about being careful with your pennies. What is it? If you mind your pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. Yep. So that's really, I don't want anyone to live on an austerity budget. It's fine once in a while if you have to go austerity just for a month, maybe two, three max. It's not, I mean, it's soul crushing to always be on an austerity budget. Mm -hmm. But yet I meet so many people who think that's how they have to live because they're living at the bottom. And also let's 
let's also bring up what is the what do you actually mean by frivolous? Of going to the movies in a th movie theater is not necessarily frivolous. No. If that is part of the entertainment that keeps you going mm -hmm. throughout the week is you got to see a movie in this experience in a theater, you know, or if it's a live theater production, if that's also what gives you life and you enjoy, you know, and then you've got the memories of it for the next several weeks and you can talk with your friends about it. And that is not being frivolous. Mm -mm, that yeah. is planning out what it is you need. It's right there with your nutrition. What do you mentally need? But as well? I will say being frivolous is never shopping the sales at grocery stores, especially the buy one, get one free or the deep discount. What do they call them? You know how they'll put them in the circular. It'll say something like truckload sale, or yeah. there's a couple other terms, you know, it'll be like just for the weekend. And it really is because they literally bought an entire 18 wheeler of this one item because the manufacturer was trying to clear out the old stock. Um, I've seen some of our local grocery stores have truckload sales on actual canned vegetables. Yeah. Like when I say truckload sales in the last five years, one time I saw a truckload sale for it's buy 10 for a dollar. 15, 14 to 16 ounce canned vegetables. And it was like the top eight canned vegetables that we all know, you know, green beans, corn, chickpeas, care. I can't remember all of them, but you know, all the, the top eight most popular veg canned vegetables that people buy at grocery stores. 10 for a dollar. And it's because these cans are not going to go bad. <laughs> Anytime soon, you could put a flat of the cans under your bed. Yep. What are they going to collect us? Oh no. Do you know how much money you're going to save versus paying a dollar fifteen or a dollar fifty per can? But again, though, as Glory mentioned when she was searching those sales, it needs to be stuff you actually eat regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't buy the stuff you don't eat. If you don't ever eat canned spinach, don't buy that. But if you know, hey, I could use canned corn, then you should definitely buy that. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong when they start looking to save is they start buying stuff because it's inexpensive and not because it's the thing that they're going to use that is also inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And so they end up basically in this weird loop where their house is full of things that they will never use. It's like the weird uh, budget hoarding, I guess. I don't know what yeah. else to call it. Where... Yeah, the house is full of all kinds of food and other things that, yeah, you got a really good deal on that, but you're spending all this other money on the food you're actually eating because I don't know why you bought all those artichokes. You don't like artichokes. Mm -hmm. If I give you, you $5, you have either. your artichokes? <laughs> like, what are you doing? So years ago, I, was, I got a subscription to this service that would tell me in my local town um what how to like get the best deal so what i mean by that is it would compare it would it was able to get information from certain grocery stores about what would be in their circulars what would be the prices before ahead of time and then they also would uh find out from the newspapers what are the coupons going to be ahead of time and you know they had figured out the cycle and so they tell you what sales coming up and what to combine with the coupons you've clipped to get the best prices and what that would be. And so one year I had the subscription and I also every Sunday went and got two copies of the Sunday paper. And back then the Sunday paper was a dollar 50. So that was $3 on top of the uh, subscription, which I think was like $5 a month. And for that price, as, as well as I actually added it up, I was married at the time. And my then husband was very upset about this, but I ended up with, I spent about a total, including the subscription, uh, I spent a total of $125 on household goods that are non-perishable, like shampoo, conditioner, toothpaste. You know, none of these things go bad, especially if you don't open them. You know, they could be good for a year on the shelf or even a couple years. Shampoo doesn't go bad, especially if you don't open it. And he was, and, but I put him in clear plastic totes and I had him stacked up. 
And he's like, I can't believe you wasted so much money. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I only bought what we actually used, you know, the shampoos and conditioners, the toothpaste that we actually like. And none of this stuff, we don't. But, like, I mean, y'all, we had, like, five or six 55-liter totes full of this stuff. And so, for $125, we did not buy toilet paper, to paper towels, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, toothpaste, toothbrushes, any of those things you could buy at grocery stores for five years. Like, I was very sad when I went to the last box and pulled out the last shampoo and conditioner and was like, well, old friends, I guess the party was fun, but this is the end. I have to go back to pay and redo. But, like, I knew what I was doing. I wasn't buying stuff we didn't use. and But I also knew this stuff does not go bad. And these prices, especially with the coupon and the, the um, quarterly sale, this was very good prices. Like, I was paying yeah. usually less than a quarter per bottle of shampoo for very fancy schmancy stuff. I mean, maybe y'all wouldn't think Tresemme and hair, whatever, herbal essence is that fancy. And back then, though, remember, it was the mid-2000s. They were fancy. Mm -hmm. But it was so nice of we, y'all, do you know how many times previously with ADHD, I had run out of body wash or shampoo or conditioner and suffered, or toilet paper, how much we had run out of all these things. Mm. And it was like anybody yelling from my bathroom, you're out of toothpaste. Is like, no, we're not. Just go down to the kitchen. It's in the totes. You have your choice of all my favorite toothpaste. You have your choice of all of my favorite shampoos and conditioners and body washes. Everything that was like way above our financial level. I bought those that I knew we liked. And like for five whole years, I never worried we were going to run out. And y'all, it took out such a huge bite out of my budget of not having to finance the monthly shampoo and conditioner and body wash and toothpaste and toilet paper and paper towels and paper plates and plastic forks, you know, and aluminum foil. Oh, I bought so much aluminum foil because what is a Jew without aluminum foil? Not much of a Jew. I'll... <laughs> That aluminum foil or Ziploc bags? What are you? Oh my God, I bought so much. I like but, expenses. Anything above Pert Plus is fancy. Yes, it is. But again, like knowing the shelf life on something. So yeah, I didn't want it dusty. So I put it in a clear plastic tote with the lid so it wouldn't get dusty. And then we just, we went to the store in my kitchen. Where I had them all stacked up. We loved it. It was so wonderful. It was so, I felt such a level of security knowing we had so many of the non perishable products and that there was no place in South Mississippi I could buy it for less. I mean, there's Megan, like, again, that is why, you know, Costco works for a lot of people mm -hmm. who are financially stable. Oh, I eventually, like in Sam's Club, when I had the money, we invested in, uh, what is it? It's not called seal meal anymore. What is it called now? You know, where you seal your, uh, you know, with cryovac? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah you know, about, I can't remember what it's called now. I, I yeah, remember. But yeah, it. like I'm so old, yeah. it's called seal meal <laughs> Yeah. Because the first one I ever bought was at a garage sale for $5 and they were selling the sealing thing with, and it came, it e y'all, it even came with the replaceable wire tape and three rolls. And they were even willing there to show me how, you know, you can also just use Ziploc bags. And I'm like, oh, can you show me first? And they did. They were like, let's go get a Ziploc bag. And then they showed how you could just seal that, use it. You could also seal uh, chip bags. And I bought, now this one, this one did not have the vacuum in it. That's why in 1993, they sold it to me for $5 because they had upgraded to the one with the vacuum in it to pull out the air. It was still absolutely worth it. 
And so, yeah, when I had the money, I paid $80 for the system. And because to be able to seal, to cryovac seal and then freeze or, you know, all of that stuff. Also, I paid the extra to get the attachment so I could cryovac seal um, the ball jars. So we are still using the pasta I sealed 10 years ago. But look, don't criticize me. Here's why. The pasta is still fresh. <laughs> Turns out if you vacuum seal pasta in glass, it really does stay fresh. It's crazy. So, well, wasn't it pasta that they found it like either it was a pasta like substance either in China or Egypt? Like, it was like thousands of years old that one of the guys got curious about and actually cooked a piece of it and it was still good. Mm -hmm. I can't remember where the dig site was, but it was some archaeologist. Pretending he was a chemist going, huh, I wonder if I can eat this. Like, well, oh. like my thing was, I was so tired of having an issue with weevils and ants. Because mm. ants, sugar ants will chew through the pasta bag because they are evil. And then your pasta is stale and full of ants. So that was my theory was they can't get through the vacuum seal in the ball jars. And... We tried it out. I literally sealed a, a, a quart jar of pasta and then I put it in an anthill and I left it for a month so it would also get rained on and see what happened. I left it on its side and the ants never got in and the water never got in. And when I opened the pasta, I broke the seal and you heard the vacuum and we boiled it up and we could not tell the difference between that and the fresh from the grocery store pasta. And a real quick, I, I feel like another way, just to, you know, let's restate it again. I like restating in many ways. Don't buy bulk, you know, in bulk, do not buy aspirational foods, such as just because you fell down the rabbit hole of chickpea recipes. And even if they all sound amazing, don't buy dried chickpeas because you want to be a chickpea person. Yeah, no, dried chickpeas are a lot of work. Unless you have a pressure <laughs> cooker. We, we are a chickpea house. Like, we love chickpeas and use them way more than the average white-skinned American typically does. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can, make, you can make from dry, you can make chickpeas in the electric pressure cooker, which, and they're really lovely. But if you only kind of like chickpeas, yeah, don't buy a costco size sack a 25 pound sack of chickpeas that's uh not like, you like yeah, ball jars and the vacuum sealing attachment to work it's like yeah i like chickpeas as a meat substitute in my soups and stews we're, we're also impulse chickpea people where we will take a bite of something and go you know what would make this better chickpeas, chickpeas. and so canned chickpeas are very good <laughs> to have in the house because yeah they, they they do make a lot of things Amazingly wonderful. Mm -hmm. Plus, you can make your own hummus really easily. Yeah, I miss being able to eat legumes. You're making me so. Say we would be eating a lot more chickpeas if Glory's digestion yeah. wasn't upset at them right now. One day I shall heal. It's a journey, but again, like we did not do this all in a day or a week or a month. Yeah. No. We stepped into smarter budgeting, frugal choices, one little tiny baby step at a time. I did not go out and buy the whatever the new seal of meal thing is and buy all the ball jars, you know, literally eight flats of ball jars, which I did do one year. I'm sure in a few years, it'll, the new version will be called a suck and seal. <laughs> suck and seal. Long. Yeah. I, I didn't do all of this in one month. I did not buy five years worth of shampoo and conditioner and body wash and toothpaste and hand soap and toilet paper and paper towel in one month. I did not do any of these. These were little incremental as I had. Like usually in my budget, I have $30 every month to spend however I want. And I refuse to answer to anyone about the $30. That's usually when I budget, I have $30 of mad money. I could do whatever experiments I want to do. Whether I buy some weird meat or I buy what, whatever. So whether it's I want to buy, 
yeah, if I want to buy something on sale, if I want to save it up for several months and then have a little weekend getaway, that's my business. And I don't ever feel guilty about it. But again, that's a baby stepping thing. That's not a diving into the deep end of the pool. By the way, the best use for chickpeas is any recipe that uses um, chunked chicken. Chickpeas really take to the same spices. Yes. I think Spence just hates chickpeas, Tom. I think Spence discovered she hates chickpeas. Like no amount of chickpeas tastes good to Spence. I know, but I'm saying like if you don't care for the taste, it does help to at least make sure you get the the spices that... I'm just going to say, you know, at a certain point, ranch. Anyway, so... Branch it solves so many sins. Yeah, that's that's the American values. But, but it's just yeah, like you told again. It's part of that whole a, bu a budget is a living document. It yeah. changes constantly. It's just a a way to understand your needs and wants and how to get them fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna you know make judgment calls every month. Your budget will change a little every month. But it helps if you have goals to work towards so that, you know, yeah, you don't have to budget for several years on any cleaning product. As long as you're happy, you, as long as you already know, you love those cleaning products. Mm -hmm. Like I know glory never has a problem with any of the scents of Tresemme. She likes their, you know, scent designs, every version. She's fine. She's happy. You can get her any Tresemme. She'll be good. So yeah, buy five years. No, no question. Versus that one body wash you used to have that's like chocolate, but it gets weird stuff with your body chemistry. Yeah. And I'm like, oh God, it's giving me a headache. I'm going to my room. Yeah, that mm, it just that's weird things bad. with your body chemistry. Yeah, I ended up smelling like a pile of leaves. <laughs> And not like, like a good leaves. fresh pile of leaves. No, no, like old. Like later in the fall, pile of leaves that had we, been in a pile for a month. Like we after a month of rain, leaves. We yeah. had the really fruity body wash that we picked up, and for some reason, with my body chemistry, it smelled like an old wet log fire. Mm. Like in the bottle, it smelled like strawberries, and it was still, it yeah. smelled so good. It touched my body, and it's like, oh, that's a swampy log that you just throw on the fire. Why did you do that? Mm -hmm. ah. no, and I don't understand how that no. happened. Yeah. But yeah, like that's what we mean about being frugal, being wise with your money, and you will be happier, you will be more satisfied. It will give you a little, a little taste of agency, of autonomy. You will have something in your life that you are controlling. And not in a, oh, if only therapy were more affordable kind of controlling way. But happily controlling. Like, you know what I'm talking about. You've met those people. They're trying to make a blink and squeal. Yeah. And at a certain point, it's like you need to move on with your life and find real hobbies. But I mean, but again, it's a. So one of the things I found, and I will bring up as well um, later in this season when we talk about uh, nutrition and weight and how to have the physique you want and what's the nutrition you need. Of a lot of overeating and overconsumption of just calories is you trying to get that brain chemistry of having agency over your life, of having control mm -hmm. and, you know, design of your life. If you have a budget, it gives you another document to go from of how, how else can I have control and influence on my life in a direction I want. Even if it's still not all going the way I want, it's still a part of your life you're getting that satisfaction from that will make you a happier, more fulfilled person. Mm -hmm. It's just having a functional budget that you like, that you can work with, and just reminds you what your goals are, including don't get so much chickpeas, stick with the red beans. What, what the, the red beans are always happy for you. Amen. Another thing with the, with the budget, 
um, especially for this audience and for those speaking, um, I came across a thing that was called the ADHD tax. Mm. And I was like, what the hell is this? I'll pay an extra tax. No one likes paying taxes. Well, it turns out it's 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 late fees, pen, late yep. penalties and fees and charges that accrue because you're a day late, two day late, three days late, weeks week late. You pay your bill every other month because you forget one month and then you go, oh, crap, I'm getting the threatening mm-hmm. calls and I pay both of these and bring it current again. Those late charges do add up. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I found that helped the budget out a lot was just putting the, the ones that have really punitive penalties or will give you monetary rewards for just doing the automatic payment, just going ahead and trusting them enough and doing the automatic freaking payment. I, I hated giving up that level of control, but it, I, I, I probably... But it's see, another part of accepting who you are. Is that who yeah. I am? And I, I've, I've saved probably $1,000 this past year just putting a bunch of stuff in automatic payments because yeah. I said that... Going- yeah. I once read that if you have paid overdraft charges more than three times in 20 years, you know, I'm talking about bank overdraft charges, then you either have ADHD or you have an addiction. Hmm. Like that's literally an article I read in psychology today years ago was you either need to be evaluated for ADHD or addiction, more than likely you have one, if not both. And that's what the article actually said. And then the whole rest of the essay was essentially backing up all of this actual research about how many times people with chemical addictions and gambling addictions and stuff pay overdraft charges and how much people, you know, who are essentially have ADHD, whether they know it or not, pay overdraft charges compared to neurotypical people without addictions. And I was like floored, like literally, because this was back when I had a subscription to the magazine. Uh, I had a subscription to Psychology Today one year. And I was like, do I have addiction? Y'all, so deep in the denial. I was like, do I have addiction? (laughs) Am I addicted to sex? What could it be? (laughs) I've never paid a prostitute. What could it be? What could it if only I could fit this was uh this was still two and a half years before I got diagnosed with ADHD. By the way, oh. Megan brings up an important thing to remember about the ADHD tax is energy and food are resources to consider when you're calculating the tax. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of how much food expires and goes bad that you have to just throw away. Yeah. As well as how much also just how much gas and energy and mental energy do you have to use? because you forgot to purchase something when you were there the first time to go buy it. And now you have to go to make a special trip to go get it. Oh, the roast Because you were out of it and you forgot to put it on the list. I'm so triggered right now. <laughs> I know the grocery deliveries are starting to become a, a thing again more in more places, but I miss the old school web van. They were the best at making sure that everything was at the house. And their mm-hmm. containers last. We're still using them because they didn't collect them when they went out of business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, yeah, of like, it just accept you're neurodivergent and you need to calculate in those things so that you are not paying unnecessary fees and you're not paying the ADHD tax in other ways, such as with your energy and your resources that you are like, okay, one of the problems with ADHD is we forget to eat or we forget to plan our meals. And so we end up, mm, I'm just going to say it, not making the wisest of choices, which means Um, we're at the end of our rope. We don't have the energy or the mental wherewithal. We're all out of executive function for the day. And we still need to make ourselves one more meal. And guess what gets torpedoed? Healthy food, vegetables. (laughs) Anything that requires cooking. Things that, that won't be done in five minutes. Things that need at least a half hour to an hour, if not. I thought an we hour were friends. You know, I well, said this is a, well, this is the whole point of budgeting is the real secret to budgeting. The super secret that nobody says out loud. It is the most frightening phrase for anyone in the Western world to admit or accept about a budget. Is a budget is a reflection of who you really are not who you aspire to be, not who you pretend to be in public. 
not who you hope you'll one day grow up to be when you become a big girl. It is who you really are. That is the budget that matters. And who you are is a trash panda. And that is why you are a dumpster diving raccoon. And that's I why, thought you know we were what? friends. We <laughs> are friends. This is the yeah. intervention. And that's why a real budget for some people includes their video game purchases and how much they can spend each year on video games and that they have to have a separate one because they don't know video games have, you know, truly a random schedule. There's no particular time of year they come out so they can always just purchase the video games they really need because that is what keeps them going yeah. every day. And after you're out of the situation, when you're no longer hungry, tired, irritable, making bad decisions afterwards, review it and be brutally honest. Because I couldn't tell you the number of times I went, I'm hungry, I'm tired, it's late, I'm going to go grab some fast food. Spent 30 minutes in drive through to get trash food paying four or five times as much as I could have just pulled something out of the freezer, put it in the oven and waited the 30 minutes and probably would have had it faster than, than even the quote unquote fast food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And once I became brutally honest with myself, I just started putting... Cheaper trash foods in the freezer. And our buckets of chicken. Because, <laughs> Noah, bailings. you are not a snowflake. I have so many friends that the secret to them oh. getting a budget that works is having a specific game budget. That is part of what it takes to actually get a working budget is you have to take care of your mental needs. And your mental needs include video games. Yeah. Just got to be brutally honest about it. <laughs> That's why I don't know how what I would do without my Audible account, to be quite honest, because I don't listen to audiobooks all the time. But when I do, it's like wall to wall, all I do. And that plus catalog where it's just like, here's a bunch of books that you might want to <laughs> you might want to listen to right now. Oh, so much trash romance. So much trash romance. Like but again, stop judging yourself and going, oh, I couldn't be that person. I have to stop giving into it. It's like, maybe accept who you are and go, oh, this is part of the nutrition of my brain and my, my, my life. I need this too. I need beans. Part of my mental nutrition is making everyone else, I feel, suffer a bit <laughs> through my, you know, bombarding them with memes on Instagram and Telegram. If I don't are you a at least once a day. Do you have dark circles under your eyes? Do you eat junk? Are you small and chubby? Do you stay up all night? Are you cute, but we'll fight? You could just come in for me. I mean, I'm yes. not small. Like, we're all trash pandas. I'm not small. Welcome to the Raccoon Support Group. Accept it. You're a freaking trash panda. By the way, you Charlie. Need budget accordingly. I'm a red panda. Thank you very much. Ah! Do you and die of fear? Does surprise kill you? Uh, a little bit. A, the funny thing is, too, thinking about budgeting, granted, it was more compromised in budgeting, but there was certain, I don't know, micro, quick microwave steamed veg, veggies that we realized, oh, just so when we're grabbing the nuggets out of the freezer, or the little pizza bites out of the freezer for a quick, lazy meal, instead of just that, just that, it would be some frozen veggies. You know? Oh, thank God we, for frozen vegetables, especially with the microwavable... Yeah, uh, packaging. Uh -huh. Neutral seasoning. I love those. Yeah. And, it, and it was, you know, yeah. for all the problems I have with Walmart, and there are so many about so many. So many. the so trash many. business that is Walmart. Walmart frozen vegetables are always very reasonably priced because they got to, you know, they are essentially subsidizing their workers for better health. So take them up on I, all those frozen vegetables. I will, I will tell you minutes. this now. Okay. I, this is my trash panda recipe, what it's like. I really do need vegetables. It is a microwave. I nuke one of those steam bags of veggies. It doesn't matter the veggies. You, Whatever. And then literally open the bag up, throw in a pat or two of butter, and liberally sprinkle in kernel seasonings, popcorn seasoning, whichever one. Would it be garlic parmesan? How about buffalo? It could be anything. Maybe for the corn, I'll use the kettle seasoning. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's whatever I feel like that day. I do love the nacho cheddar. Oh, I got a problem. And okay. you just stir it up and it's like plunk it in a bowl. We are. This is dinner along with whatever trash food I actually want to eat. But this is like 
Look, I'm putting this in my body. It'll be okay. Okay, if we're going ultimate trash panda, so ramen ra- ramen noodles that you cook up with some everything bagel seasoning in there. Like throw mm-hmm. away the seasoning. Just put the everything bagel se- seasoning in, in there. Mm-hmm. Boil, boil it up all nice. Sli- slice of American cheese and a boiled egg. All you need in life. Nice. <laughs> I've just learned how to, how to semi-fry poach the egg on top of the ramen noodles as it's oh, still yeah. microwaving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that will help your nutrition a load a lot. Of uh, yeah, eggs are a great source of protein and a lot of other nutrients. Brussels you not separate your egg white. whites from your yolks. Eat the egg yolk with the egg white, y'all. Don't yeah. let people get you to eat just egg whites. Oh, that's uh, bad. What was it? You'll end up with what is it? A magnesium or a biotin deficiency or something? Biotin. It sucks the biotin out of your body. Yeah. Eating just egg whites will suck biotin out of your body. Now, what will stop your the egg whites from sucking biotin out of your body? You ready? Egg yolk. <laughs> so if you eat the yolk with the white, you're fine. If you separate them and only eat the egg white, you're effed. Same so don't for milk products. make you be healthy when you don't need to be healthy, my sweet little trash. Don't, don't eat. Don't. Don't eat milk products that are fat free. It'll suck the nutrition without, out. For some reason, without the milk fats, milk protein and carbs are actually bad for the body. Mm-hmm. It's weird. But like yes, body doesn't handle it well. It like part. I really genuinely part of successful budgeting is accepting we are all trash pandas, and we are just living from dumpster to dumpster. I mean, oh, don't forget do the classic, it. Megan, the truly classic. You've, you've just left out one ingredient for the mac and cheese. If you're adding oh, in tuna and Is that where you cheese, crumble up the potato yeah. chips on top? Yes, yeah, so you, you need some potato chips on top. Or you can crumble up some Ritz crackers. Yes. Yes. Either way, we are the trash pandas. Yes, eat, the, eat your delicious trash panda food. Yum, yum, yum. But, but again, yeah, but stop denying who you are. A budget is just a part of a way to understand who are you really and just accept it. And then, you know what? Your finances can improve because you're not spending on stuff you're never going to use. Just because you're a trash panda doesn't mean that you're destined to always live in financial crisis to financial crisis. That is not one is not necessarily connected to the other. You can be a trash panda that has financial stability for decades. I promise you, because I come from a very long line of trash pandas on both sides of the family. And yet, financial stability everywhere. It's really kind of odd. Glory has the most delicate stomach among us. I know. I'm the princess. I am the princess in our trash panda dynasty. It is true. But again, part this is what I had to learn the hard way when I was in my early 20s. And I realized I was really having a lot of problems with keeping financial stability and not getting overdraft fees and ending up where I'm not even sure if I can pay rent um, or that I'll need to, you know, find another way to make up the difference because I I didn't quite realize the end of the month was going to happen or something. And what really that long journey of the long, dark tea time of glory soul what I learned was that I needed to accept who I am and stop trying to budget like I'm a normal human being because I am not. I am a semi-feral creature who does not make sense and who eats a lot of junk food late at night and watches a lot of junk TV and likes to hang out with my trash panda friends and little goblins, dumpster goblins, all the time. And then sometimes we have cookouts. And that this is actually where I'm most comfortable and happiest. And at a certain point, I need to accept that. So if that means I need a ground beef budget, <laughs> because we do so many cookouts, then so be it. It makes me happy. If that, like, seriously, there was a time in my life because of who my friends at that point are, I literally had a liquor budget because we'd have cookouts. And 
the rule among my this group of friends, this is when I was like 20. This was the year uh, of underage drinking where that's when I drank the most of my entire life. And the rule was uh, that you had to bring the liquor you wanted to drink. You couldn't be sure that anyone else would have what you wanted. However, my over 21 friends would buy my liquor for me. I just tell them what I wanted. And I was drinking at people's houses. So technically in Mississippi, like it's in this gray area. So we were fine. Pretty much as long as the cops don't show up, it's totally fine. And I set up a cookout budget because I knew my mother would see it. And so I couldn't call it my liquor budget. But essentially every week I budgeted a fifth of alcohol because the gracious thing you were supposed to do when you go to the cookout is when the cookout is over, you're supposed to leave whatever remains left of your bottle there at their house. That is, you know, your hostess gift, sort of, uh, so that, you know, they essentially get kind of paid in cleaning up their house and hosting you with, you know, getting a little bit left over of any of the supplies. And so, yeah, I just budgeted. $20 every week for these cookouts. And it was a wonderful time. And I absolutely mostly do not regret that entire year of underage drinking. I'm so sorry if that upsets anybody, but I had a really great time, except that one time that um, I drank way too much on antidepressants. But again, <laughs> I learned yeah. 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 They change things. Oh yeah. No alcohol and antidepressants and antipsychotics do not fix. Uh, the shiny click clacks make the brain go burr. Sorry, he said goblins and dice. I mean, yeah, all my friends are trash pandas and d goblins. They're dumpster goblins and dice goblins. Like, these are my people, and I love you we all. Had, we had to help our friend yesterday we were visiting with, and she's talking about why is there always stuff in my bra? And it's like, because the goblin. girls are goblins. You have goblin titties. They just yeah. like to grab onto things. They like shiny pebbles. They like food. They just want to hold on to things. There's nothing wrong with goblining. We all need some goblins in our lives. Yeah. I like if you're neurodivergent, uh, you're probably happiest with trash pandas and dumpster raccoons and goblins. I know I am. That's what Chicago's all about. All the goblins will convene in one location for one week. But anyway, does anyone have any final thoughts? Don't give in to the dark side. You don't have to be overly controlling unless things are extremely dire. Like if you're in an emergency crisis situation, lean into it. Just, you know, turn off the electricity and sit in the dark a lot. Charge your phone at your friend's house when you're visiting. That is, look, if your friends are real friends, they will understand. They will understand if you're like, hey, could I charge my hybrid car at your house? Like, if your friends love you, they will understand. And if they don't understand, it is time you move on and go sit in the dark by yourself at your own house. Because these people are trash. And yeah. not like Trash Panda, Dumpster Dive. These people are just not worth your time and energy. Good people understand when we're going through hard times. Because they've probably been there too. Um, another thing, I don't think we actually sat there at this whole thing, just kind of talked around it. The the purpose of a budget is your mental well-being that is its end goal is your happiness if the budget is making you sad you need a new budget you need to figure out why is this i mean it, there's a small chance it could also just be because you're still in denial about who you are but in the end a budget should make you happy with all your choices so if it's not, work on another budget. Just keep working on it. It's a toy like anything else to play with. Have fun with it. And yes, if you need, get all the dice that go click clack and make the brain go brrr. Mm -hmm. Pretty dice make a pretty life. You can have the things. But... I don't know how you're going to have all the things if you don't first accept yourself for exactly who you are. 
there is something mutually exclusive about financial stability and identity denial. Mm. I'm not entirely sure exactly why it's this, it's why they're mutually exclusive. You just, you're going to have to accept yourself for who you really are. I, I will tell you the truth. My mother did not get there until what she was in her early fifties. She and I had so many conversations about her financial overdrafts and everything. And why was she still doing this? And even she had to come to a place of acceptance and figure out who she really was. And so what kind of budget and how to run her own finances. Hence, she too eventually adopted the, um, the cushion in the bank account, in the checking account. Mm. And figured out how much of a cushion she needed to put in there so that she did not overdraft anymore. And then guess what? Five years later, she had an overdraft. She's like, I can't believe it. I had an overdraft. I'm like, did you get rid of your cushion? She's like, I thought I didn't need it anymore because it had been five years since I overdrafted. And I'm like, you have to accept who you are and that you will always be a person who needs that cushion in your checking account. You just have to accept it to you or it's not something you grow out of. We don't grow out of being who we really are at the heart of ourselves. And that was when I stopped feeling so exposed and vulnerable every time I'd open up my financial softwares. Oh, God, I used to feel terrible. Literally, I would have to gird myself to go open up my bank records mm -hmm. every month because I felt like whatever had gone wrong was entirely my fault and not had it didn't have anything to do with me denying who I am at the heart of myself. So, yes, to have financial security and stability, you do have to sort of go on a personal journey. I don't mean to get woo woo about this, but it is woo woo. It's time for you to accept exactly who you are so that you could have the financial life you really want to have. And this really reminds me, everything you're saying of something that Philip Cargon sa said that I have like held on to for so much of my life. He said that there are basically two paths that you're going to be offered in life. One promises perfection and the other promises wholeness. Avoid the path that promises perfection. It will tell you who you are, not help you be what you are. And yeah, I, that is really a lot of what we're talking about here is learning to develop into that state of wholeness. And I like the way he juxtaposes the two words because mm -hmm. we do get lost in this world of it's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. Yes. And nothing is perfect. Only dead things that are set in stone can be perfect and, uncha and unchanging. And even then time will change them. Perfection is an illusion. It's not a reality. It's you just it's something you can see from a one specific angle, but any you take half a step in each direction and it's no longer perfect. It's not real. But wholeness is. Liking who you see in the mirror every day, including check balance day, that is real. I never thought I would get to a place in my life where when I wash my hands and I look in the mirror and I see myself washing my hands, I don't hate the person I see. But it has been, what, almost 15 years since I hated the person I saw. And I, before that, I never thought I would get there. I really never thought it. I used to pray that one day I would look in the mirror and not hate that person. or And not, like, find things that are wrong with that person. I really thought it would never happen because I'd been working for it forever. And by accident, I got there because I so desperately needed financial stability. I just could not afford, there were not, I, I didn't really have other people, like a lot of people who could financially help me out of a bind. And I realized it, like I was so close to homelessness so many times and y'all, homelessness sucks, but homeless as a woman is dangerous. And I just didn't want to, like, get back into all the trauma. I didn't want to, like, 
get more trauma after I had been working so hard to process my childhood trauma. And so all of that really pushed me to the incredibly uncomfortable place of going on a journey and accepting who I am just so I could not have overdraft fees. But I really needed to not have overdraft fees. I really needed to not get evicted. I really needed this. And the only way I could figure to get this was in this journey of self-acceptance. It's, it's not the most comfortable journey. But the rewards are so good. To not worry that one day you're going to go outside and your car will be missing because it's been repossessed. That is the sleep of the innocent. Oh, God, you're going to sleep so deep into your bed that it's like you've just sank into it. You're going to sleep so deep, not worrying that one day you go out there and the car won't be there because the rightful owners took it back. That's what I mean of. It's like you have to go on a side quest to get the main quest because for some reason people don't talk about this. Nobody told me I have to come to a place of acceptance about who I am in order to not have overdraft fees. I had to figure this out the hard way with a lot of tears and a lot of self-recrimination. And a little bit of therapy. All right, let's see. What are we talking about next week? Oh, oh, why are the arms so short? All right. Ah, next week, July 3rd, we are going to talk about looking your best. Tom, that's your cue, buddy. All right. So here's where we're going to talk about things that make. So look, we're just going to have to accept as much as you know. we were told growing up to not do this. We live in a world where everyone's judged on looks. And so we're going to talk about all the little tips and tricks we have figured out over the years so that we always look put together and people think we have a clue what we're doing. It's an easy um, Yes. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, why it matters that all of your clothes are in your quote unquote color wheel. Um, we're going to talk about figuring out what makes you look alive. A little bit about nutrition. So your skin looks good. Um, the, you know. How, how to get much... your clothes to fit like you're freaking wealthy. What kind of accessories do you need so you look like you meant to look this way? But all these things that make it look like you know what you're doing from appearance alone without having to think about it. Because it is possible to do this without having to think an hour or two every day to get dressed. It is possible to literally just look at a little list and make sure you have all these clothes on. And that's it. You will already look like you plan to look this way. And everyone will go, you look amazing. How'd you do that? And they will think you are being facetious when you go, I just stepped out of my room this way. Oh, there is a lot of little tips and tricks we have picked up. Everyone should know. So it's not such a mental mentally exhaustive task just to get dressed and go out to the world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be. It really can be so simple that it requires no thought. Literally, you can get dressed in the dark and you'll still yeah. look like a million bucks. And we mm -hmm. know we tried this out a bunch of times. Also, we not necessarily, you know, dark. planning to, it just worked yeah, out we, that we way. Yeah, we have like, really like post hurricanes and power outages dressed to get dark. And it turns out it absolutely works every time. And we will talk about accessories. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. What they, what they know, what comic books artists already know. Mm-hmm. 
that make their characters look real. Spoiler, the real secret to looking your best is you need to accept exactly who you are. Again, if you want this, you have to accept wholeness. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of funny. Like they try to sell all these goods of here, you'll look great if you just buy our product. When in fact, what you really need to look great is you need to accept who you really are and not who you just think you want to be. I mean, I, okay, honestly, at this point, I think it may be a week or two I've now spent laughing that somebody said I was out of their league because by them just saying leagues, and based on looks, I knew that I was, in fact, out of their league. They yes. just didn't realize the direction. I have been very surprised going on dates in the last year of so many people saying, I don't know that we can go out again. You're just really out of my league. And I'm like, wait, what? But you actually saw me in person. I can understand. It's a little intimidating being amongst your perfection. Stop. I say that for both of you. Like having had it's to share a hotel room with these two people. I mean, like, How oh God, I felt like you? a raggedy end all. Shut up. <laughs> By the way, I would like to point out that you put on the clothes I brought and you also look like a million bucks. So it's something anyone can do. It's just cl <laughs> it's clothing and it's it's just a little bit of geekery. Like, that is what we're talking about. We're talking about mm -hmm. taking care of your skin, and we geeked it. We've, like, really researched it so we could just share this so you don't have to, like, get all deep into the research like we did. We're talking about the clothing, how to, like, make sure the cuts of clothing look good on you and how to adjust it if you can't find exactly the right cut of clothing or you can't afford it. So, like, literally how you can retailer T-shirts, like how the rich and wealthy do. But you can do this by yourself. You can actually hand do it, truthfully. That's how and, we discovered that I look good if I dress like an 80s teenager and it somehow doesn't look dated on me. It's weird. Yeah, and all the young people like the 80s, so you look topical. But, like... All of it is just trappings. It's not any genetics things. We can't change anything about our genetics. This is the dice roll each of us got. Good, bad, or indifferent, this is all we got. Y'all, if but, they can make Conan O'Brien look put together, and oh his genetics God. is so messed up oh, by his own like, admission. He's like a really tall Irish voodoo doll of nonsense. Like his proportions oh, really are all wrong. And we could actually diagram his clothing because that is some genius stuff. Because I've like looked at it and I'm like, look at it. They they look, they set him up so that he doesn't look like a freakish doll. So again, these, so I did a bunch of research for what, about 15 years? Mm -hmm. Because I grew up with my mother telling me that I was ugly and that I better work on my personality. Oh, that's also like, familiar. And I'm like, but this is the only personality I have. And she's like, oh, you better get good at charm then. Um, <laughs> so I like did a lot of observation about what people call beautiful. Like what is beauty standards? And what I really found is genetics is one component of beauty standards. Having a symmetrical face really helps. However, two thirds of the things that people call beautiful or call beauty standards are actually things that you can change. They're not genetics. They are things within your control, like the cut of your clothes, the color of your clothes, how you wear accessories or don't wear accessories, your haircut. All these things are things you actually have control over and people will perceive you as beautiful. And it's just, you don't even need a ton of money either, by the way. Like I literally cut my own hair. And like I've cut Tom's hair in the past a bunch. I used to cut mom's hair. It's not something that actually requires a whole lot of skill when you know how to cut it. Now, yes, it, yes, to look truly polished, it helps if you pay for a nice professional haircut. But sometimes you just need an approximation and then you could just go to Supercuts and they'll just finish it. So I'm just saying, 
Tom and I, well, I have spent, and then I dragged Tom into my research. I have spent literally decades now researching what people call beautiful and found out that two thirds of it are totally within all of our control and don't even cost a ton of money. Mm -hmm. They don't even cost any money, actually. Um, you just need to know what you're looking for. You need to essentially have your eye trained so that you know what to buy, what to invest in, and how to dress yourself and how to style your hair and all the things. It's just about training the mm -hmm. eye and knowing what to look for. And that is why people think what they think about us. Trust me, we really are not that attractive. I know it's the one thing that my mom was really right about. She always said, if I kept dressing the way that I do, that I would never attract a good wife. And she was right. Yeah, because you're looking mm -hmm. for a good husband. <laughs> and you got that. So you can accomplish. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's essentially what it's about is all of the things that I researched and then shared with Tom about how to look great where people think you look socially acceptable if not actually like the where how do i put this where you look like you're an asset to their social group because that was what i was interested in i was tired of getting turned away this was before i realized it was neurodivergent or that what neurodivergent meant and i noticed i kept getting took pushed away from a variety of social engagements and i noticed that pretty people no matter how awkward they are or how they say inappropriate things all the time are still welcomed into social engagements because they're considered a beauty asset. And so I figured, well, maybe I should see if I can add anything so that I'll look like a beauty asset without having to do a ton of work because I'm ultimately lazy. And this is what we're going to talk about next week. We hope we'll get to see you. Thank you all so much for being here. I could see the numbers and y'all are still hanging out with us and I really appreciate that. And as always, let us know what you think in the comments or the chat. We really do read everything because, you know, what else are we going to do? It's not like we have a life. This is our life. So we'll see you next week. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you.